In honor of Warhammer Day, we've put together this compilation of stories from the previous year. It's the ideal thing to listen to while painting or modeling your minis. I really hope you like it. Happy Warhammer Day, everyone. The Burden of Brotherhood by Duncan War. Corian wrenched his gauntleted hand free from the other man's torso. The jagged, cruel-looking blades of the Power Fist's lightning claw still sparked as the remaining viscera evaporated from the weapon's ugly, curved surfaces. He watched with a heavy heart as the once indomitable power-armored warrior before him collapsed to the ground, the man's body now limp and lifeless. Try as he might, he found himself unable to look away from the blood that pooled around his feet, leaking slowly from the few uncauterized wounds left in the torso of his fellow space marine. Rising to his feet, Corian looked between the faces of the other members of the small cadre of captains and lieutenants that had been present for the ceremony. They were his inner circle, his advisors, and the few that he trusted to be privy to what had just taken place. Their expressions mirrored his own, ashen and grave, uncomfortable with what had happened, but resigned to it nonetheless. It was not the first time they had been forced to take such extreme action, and he doubted if any of them expected it to be the last. So rampant had the blight that ate away at their chapter become. As he stepped away from the motionless corpse, Corian struggled to maintain his composure. To die on the battlefield was one thing that was expected of a space marine, but this, on one's knees in a darkened hold far from battle, it was not right. He stared down at the man he had once called Brother, a man he had killed with his own hand and felt a dark malaise creep over him. Every time he found himself in this place, that sensation rooted itself further and further into his soul, and it became that much harder for him to come out of the other side of it. Powerful emotions roiled deep within the chapter master, threatening to boil up to the surface at the mildest provocation, and he struggled to get them back under control. Cathal, one of the number of captains that were present, moved forward, seemingly about to speak. Yet upon making eye contact with Corian, the man held silent retiring back to the edge of the circle. Standing in the center of the group, their dead brother lying at his feet, Corian knew that he should say something, that he should deliver some words of substance, something that would refocus and solidify the bond they all shared with one another. But in that moment, such a natural, simple task proved utterly beyond him. What would be the point? They all knew these ceremonies had to continue, Nothing he could say would change that simple fact, and nothing he did would ever wash the stain of his brother's blood from his hands. The warrior stormed out of the room, his temper flaring at the futility of it all, his mood dark. Pacing rapidly down the hallway, his frustrations built. No, what these men needed right now, Corian could not provide. Only the enemy would be able to do that. Rounds hammered into the earth around them as Cathal and his squad of space marines charged headfirst into the oncoming barrage. Cresting the rise, they cleared the open ground and were finally in amongst the heretics' lines. A chaotic melee ensued, with combat descending into a primal and disorganized crush, the enemy's sheer numbers making any kind of cohesion impossible for the space marines as they hacked and slashed their way through the fanatical humans. Out of the corner of his eye, Cathal saw one of his fellow warriors, Keir, approaching an intersection in the trench works, only to be slammed backwards from the impact of a long section of steel rebar that knocked the combat blade from his hand. The large, hulking form of an ogrin soon stomped into view, swinging its makeshift club indiscriminately and hitting friend and foe alike as it went. Captain, Keir called out in surprise, drawing the full attention of the other space marine. The stench of the rag-covered creature filled the air as it rained blow after blow down upon the unarmed warrior, its vast mass belying the speed and ferocity with which it moved. Cathal struggled to make his way through the press of bodies to aid his fellow space marine, but for every one of the zealots he cut down, another two appeared to take their place. His chainsword had long since stopped working, the mechanism choked with chunks of bone and body matter, and the captain had resorted to using the weapon as a blunt instrument against his enemies. At last, having freed himself from the mass of foes that sought to pull him down, Cathal quickly closed the distance to Keir. The beset warrior had been knocked backwards and was pinned against the sidewall of the trench. 
The berserker Ogryn raised its weapon, ready to bring the huge slab of ferrocrete down on the space marine's head for a final time. Fearing that he was too late, Cathal immediately reached for his bolt pistol. Brother, get down! But before he could bring his weapon up, Kier reached out an arm towards his attacker, and a giant explosion of light seared from the space marine's hand. The foul mutant was immediately wreathed in a pillar of ethereal flame, screaming desperately as it tried to escape the burning agony. Rushing to Kier's side, Cathal hauled the Astartes back to his feet, the man's face a rictus of despair. It is in me, Kier's voice sounded hollow as he spoke. Captain, the taint has touched me. Corian stood amongst the flora of the strike cruiser's arboretum, clad simply in robes of coarse weave. He gazed up through the tall glass panes at the dark expanse that lay beyond. Taking in the great swathe of stars that lay before him, he wondered at how many lives were being spent at that very moment in defense of the hulking behemoth that was the Imperium. The warrior remained silent as Cathal entered the quiet sanctum and joined his chapter master at the observation point. Several minutes passed before the captain spoke, his voice low and heavy in the muted atmosphere of their surroundings. Kier is undergoing the rites of acceptance as we speak. It will not be long before it is time for the purification ritual. Corian grimaced, and Cathal turned to regard his commander, concern written across his features. This is not a burden you have to bear alone, my lord. I have been speaking with the others, and they concur. We should all take our share of the- No! The chapter master's voice reverberated loudly in the enclosed space as he locked eyes with the other space marine. It is bad enough that I have to dishonor myself with such acts. I will not allow it to contaminate the others. He looked back out at the vast blackness spread before them, finally continuing more softly. It is my responsibility, and mine alone. There is nothing to be gained from sharing in this sin. Corian, Cathal continued to push. If you think we do not see how this wears upon your soul, you are mistaken. Why should you alone be forced to suffer through it? Cold laughter rang out from the chapter master, the atmosphere growing noticeably tense. Why should I suffer? Me? Let me ask you, Cathal, when I still the beating hearts of our brothers, who do you think it is that truly feels pain? The captain did not have time to answer before his commander continued. How many of our own people's lives have we been forced to cut short? How many of them have we led down to some dark, forsaken corner of this ship before bleeding them dry? And for what? because they dared to manifest the psychic gifts that the Emperor himself imparted to us. Is that why we must end their existence and expunge their glories from our chapter's history? Corian threw his arms wide with incredulity. Why must we hide what we are? You know how the High Lords will view such rampant manifestation of latent psychic abilities, my lord, Cathal answered him, and you know exactly what their response will be. The chapter master's eyes grew wide with intense fervor, and how does spilling the blood of our own help the Imperium? Where is the gain in that? Corian gestured out at the vista beyond the ship's exterior. Look at it. An entire galaxy filled with the weak and the simpering, the corrupt and the decadent, and all the while we fight and die. Then we have to hide what we are from them, as if we are somehow the unclean and unworthy ones. He turned on his captain accusingly. Kier was one of yours. You cannot tell me that you think this is right. Cathal took a step towards his chapter master, his voice rising to match the level of the other space marine. You know I do not, but think for a moment about what you are saying. If we allowed knowledge of this corruption to get out, it could damn us all. Every one of our brothers would be put to the sword if we were discovered, and you know that. Corian's anger was blunted at the pain evident in the other man's eyes, and he raised a hand in apology. Searching his old friend's face for a reaction, the chapter master asked him carefully, but what if there was another way? The rest of Corian's inner circle were ready and waiting when the chapter master stalked into the dark cargo hold. In the center of the room, dressed in full battle armor, stood Kier, his helmet under one arm and his head held high. The chapter master strode purposefully through the group, coming to a stop before his fellow warrior, his true emotions suppressed beneath a stoic mask of detachment. The air in the room was solemn and heavy, many of the assembled observers having fought alongside Kier numerous times over the years, some of them owing their lives to the Space Marine. Corian took a deep breath, steeling himself for what was about to come. 
Every time he had to execute one of his own, he could feel a piece of himself break deep within. No fighter should ever have to be the one to end the life of one of his brothers. These men were everything to him. The brotherhood that was forged between a group of warriors who fought alongside one another, let alone ones who bore the same shared genetic lineage as the members of the Adeptus Astartes, ran to the very core of who they were. These were people he would risk his life for without a moment's hesitation, and every part of him rebelled at the mere thought of what he was about to do. With a sharp cracking sound, the chapter master activated the power feeds that ran through his gauntlet and into the blades of the lightning claw. The room was immediately lit with the bright blue glare given off by the weapon, casting stark shadows across the features of the various individuals stationed around the room. Kier did not flinch at the sudden noise, the man's posture sober and resolute, despite the knowledge of what was about to befall him. The chapter master looked down into the other man's eyes. In those black recesses, all he could see were the faces of each and every one of his comrades, whose lives he had been forced to cut short. Corian's fingers twitched involuntarily, causing Keir to look down, unsure of what was happening as the subtle movements sent light cascading around the enclosed space. Corian had had few interactions with the warrior before him, but he could see he bore the same strength of will and resolute spirit that were the defining characteristics of their chapter, and it left him with little doubt that the man's loss would be felt deeply amongst his fellow warriors. Corian had made a point of learning the names of every Astartes he had executed as a result of this so-called blight making its way through their chapter. He had made sure to memorize them all, lest their sacrifices be forgotten, and the thought of adding yet another name to that ever-growing list finally broke something deep within him. The continuous crackling of the lightning claw fell silent as the chapter master deactivated the massive weapon, plunging the hold into near darkness once more. The faces of his assembled confidants looked up questioningly. Corian's voice was unsteady and ragged as he tried to force the words out. No. The room remained silent. Not again. The chapter master shook as he spoke, the servos of his armor grinding with sympathetic movements. Do we not bleed enough for them already, that now we must kill our own as well? Some members of the group looked to one another with concern. Corian's voice grew louder as he straightened his posture, catching the eyes of each man in turn. I know that many of you also feel it, this thing buried deep within us. This, the chapter master struggled to find the right words. Awakening. It will take each of us in turn eventually, I have no doubt now. There was nodding amongst the others, as the chapter master placed a placating arm on Kier's shoulder, before returning to address the group as a whole. Are we to lie down and die like dogs for no other reason than the way we were made? He continued, his voice becoming increasingly fervent. We are warriors of the Adeptus Astartes. How much have we suffered and endured for the Emperor and his precious Imperium, only for us to stand here fearing sanction? And as what? Heretics? Witches? Murmurs of assent echoed around the room. The chapter master pointed to each man in turn. I bleed for you, and you, and you, my brothers, but not for this. He pointed to the Aquila emblazoned across his chest armor. Not any more. Corian gestured dramatically to include every person in the room. Between us we have conquered entire subsectors, single-handedly destroying whole legions of Xenos and human alike. What do we truly have to fear? The faces of the space marines that surrounded him mirrored Corian's own conviction. We are warriors, not cattle. We are the predators, not the prey. It is time we acted as such. It was Cathal who stepped forward, earnestness written plainly across his face. What would you have us do, Lord? Corian grasped him with both hands, a cold smile forming as he answered. We take back our destiny, my brother, for you, me, and every one of our comrades that have died protecting this hollow, corrupt ideology of mankind. The chapter master turned to take in the rest of the room, speaking with surety. We fight for us now. Some will resist, brother, Cathal warned quietly. What do we do then? Corian's face took on an almost fanatical zeal then we must enlighten them. Emperor's Wrath In her frustration, Sister Superior Lutia punched the wall. The other sororitas in the strike squad looked over at the sudden outburst. Their sympathetic eyes made her feel even angrier, 
so she turned to look out the viewing port on the side of the Thunderhawk, her piercing emerald eyes reflected in the reinforced glass. Outside, she saw the colony of Sanctum Veritas far in the distance. Veritas was a small shrine world nestled on the fringes of the sector. Its single-habited colony had been a place of solace and worship, a beacon of imperial devotion on an otherwise desolate world. The towering spires of its many places of worship pierced the barren skies, demonstrating, to all with eyes to see, humanity's unwavering faith in the god-emperor. The most impressive of these, at the very heart of the settlement, was the great shrine of Veritas. It was where the order militant Sororitas was stationed to protect the world and uphold the imperial truth. Lucia prayed that some of them were still alive. She had spent many years stationed at Sanctum Veritas. It had been during her training to become a full sister of the Adeptus Sororitas and a useful instrument of the Emperor's divine will. While she was there, she had forged deep bonds with her fellow novitiates, especially one, Sister Mirabelle. Mirabelle's laughter had filled the halls of the shrine, her unwavering resolve an inspiration to all who knew her. Their friendship had been one of the greatest joys of her youth. And now, in all likelihood, she was dead. Dead at the hands of feckless heretics and traitors. The anger boiled up inside her again. When it couldn't be contained any more, she struck out at the wall twice more. Sister Serafina came to sit beside her. Are you all right, Sister Superior? she asked. I will be, when I've got something to shoot at. I know Legatine Mirabelle of the Great Shrine well. She would not have given up without a fight. But there is a chance there are holdouts, and if there is, I have no doubt she is amongst them. She was the best of us. Lucia paused a lump in her throat at mentioning Mirabelle in the past tense. She is. The best of us. As the Thunderhawk made its approach to the great shrine of Veritas, it flew low over the colony, giving Lucia a good view of what the traitors had done to the holy outpost. The once resplendent spires were decorated with twisted symbols dedicated to the ruinous powers, made from the tortured bodies of Veritas's faithful. Bonfires burned on every street corner, fueled by human remains. Lucia's grip tightened on her blessed bolter, and she silently prayed for the chance to take revenge on those that had committed such atrocities. Suddenly an explosion rocked the Thunderhawk as the gunship started to spin and twist as the pilot struggled to keep the aircraft under control. Sister Serafina quickly buckled herself into the seat where she sat. Looks like anti-aircraft. We're close, though, Sister Octavia explained. Then take us down. We'll continue the rest of the way on foot, Lucia ordered. The Thunderhawk descended and lowered its forward ramp to touch the desecrated soil of Veritas. Then the four sisters of battle disembarked. First was Lucia, her alabaster skin a stark contrast to the obsidian black of her sororitas armor. Then came young sister Serafina, followed by Octavia and Uriel. Sister Octavia, a veteran of many battles, was the first to speak. This place reeks of heresy and abomination. The heretic scum have shown no mercy. We must do the same. Lucia nodded, her gaze fixed on the looming shrine a few blocks away. They advanced through the ruins of the shrine world colony. As they went, their power-armored boots crunched on shattered pieces of stained glass from windows that had depicted scenes of purity and devotion. They passed statues of saints and martyrs that had been defiled and broken, replaced by perverse effigies that spoke to the darkest parts of the human soul. Sister Uriel, the squad's heavy weapon specialist, cleansed each abomination with douses of purifying Promethean from her flamer. Lucia wanted to see each one ground into dust, but her own petty desires didn't matter. Her instructions were to secure the shrine, and if there were any sororitas survivors, that's where they'd be. Lucia's thoughts turned to her friend Sister Mirabel. The memories of their shared laughter and shared prayers weighed heavily on her. How she hated them, the heretical rebels that had turned from the Emperor's light, defiled this place and took her friend from her. 
A muralled public square extended across the front face of the great shrine. As the sisters cautiously made their way across it, they came under fire. They scurried for cover behind a large toppled statue of an unidentifiable imperial saint. The statue, once a piece of devotional art, had been battered and smashed into a featureless mass that only vaguely resembled a human shape. Lucia cautiously raised her head over the ruined statue and aimed her bolter. At the foot of the stairs that led to the shrine was a traitor. He wore stained white robes that were decorated with profane symbols that could have been painted in blood. He wildly sprayed bullets towards them from a heavy stubber mounted on a tripod in front of him. With a single round, Lucia dispatched him to whatever hell his corrupted soul deserved, and the stubber fell silent. At the sound of gunfire, a group of similarly robed heretics charged out of the shrine, screaming and yelling with a manic zeal. When they were within range, Sister Uriel lit them up with a gout of flame from her flamer. The crazed charge faltered as they were consumed, except for a lone traitor. The towering brute, armed with an oversized cleaver, rushed on oblivious to the flames that wrapped around him and swung his hefty weapon at Sister Seraphina. Her power armor gave her strength well beyond her diminutive size, and she parried the blow with her blessed chainsword, sparks flying from the clash of metal on metal. With a swift counterattack, Seraphina lunged forward, sweeping her chainsword up to tear through the heretic's throat. He fell to the ground, gurgling and choking on his own blood. An excellent strike, sister, Uriel observed. The Emperor expects nothing less, Seraphina beamed. A few more heretics ran out of the shrine. Lucia and Sister Octavia fired their bolters, easily felling them in bursts of blood and viscera. They strode up the stairs to the shrine's entrance. The massive bronze doors stood ajar with dark, foreboding whispers emanated from within. Lucia paused for a moment, her gauntleted hand reaching out to touch the tarnished aquila that adorned the doors. It had been hacked at and soiled with various kinds of filth. Lucia took a step back and addressed the others. Sisters, we shall reclaim this sacred place. The Emperor watches over us, and his wrath shall be our weapon. For Mirabelle and all our fallen sisters, we will cleanse this shrine. And then they went in. Their power-armored boots echoed through the darkness of the desecrated hallways, the atmosphere oppressive and wrong. As they moved deeper into the shrine, they encountered many slain sisters. They had served the Emperor faithfully, but now lay lifeless and defiled. But Lucia's anger gave way to confusion as they found many of them had either been poisoned or shot in the back. The deeper they went, the more the evidence of treachery grew. Just how had the cult managed to infiltrate so deep into the sororitas stronghold was a mystery to her, until she entered the inner sanctum. The grand hall at the heart of the great shrine had become a place of darkness. The sacred space had been transformed into a twisted chamber of utter depravity. Hanging on chains from the four grand pillars that held up the domed roof were sisters of battle, their bodies bloodied and still. Sat in the middle on a veritable throne of bones was Sister Mirabel. Three power-armored sisters stood at her side, their bolters aimed at Lucia and her squad. Their faces were beautiful, like those of marble statues but their eyes shone with an unnatural radiance. Mirabel, what's happening here? Lucia asked, not wanting to believe the evidence of her eyes. Mirabel's youthful features had taken on a sinister allure. Her lips, painted a dark, seductive shade, curled into a wicked smile. The same smile that had once offered warmth and camaraderie to her fellow sisters of battle was now a lure to lead the unwary astray. The righteous zeal that had burned within her had turned to an unholy fire of madness. Mirabel rose from where she was sat opening her arms wide, as if offering Lucia an embrace. Lucia, my darling, you're here. I had hoped it would be you they'd send. It would mean so much to be together with you again, Mirabel purred her voice like honey. What madness is this? How could you betray the Emperor, our sisters and everything you believe in? Lucia asked. 
Mirabelle let out a throaty laugh, dripping with unsettling allure. Oh, Lucia, you see it all wrong. You say that as if I had a choice, as if any of us had a choice. They forced this life on us, indoctrinated us, but I'm free now from the shackles of dogma and conformity. The Emperor, our order, they're just chains, Lucia. Chains that bind our desires and passions. Can't you see I've found true liberation? And so can you. Liberation? You call this liberation? Lucia's voice trembled with a mixture of sadness and anger. What you've done, the blood of our sisters on your hands. Mirabelle sultrily slinked over to one of the sisters chained to a column. Do you know why I've always liked you? she asked as she grabbed the chain sister's hair and yanked her head to look up. The woman, evidently still alive, gave a feeble groan of pain as she did so. Sister Serafina started to move to her aid when Lucia motioned her to stop, watching the three traitor sororitas that pointed their bolters at them out of the corner of her eyes. You're not like these boring prissy drones. I've seen it, your passion. The feelings that well up so much within you that containing them makes you feel like you'll explode. But you don't need to be restrained by the edicts of a distant and indifferent god. Think about it, Lucia. You can be free to feel and be who you were meant to be. You can join me, my dear friend, and experience the world you have been denied your whole life. Lucia clenched her bolter, knuckles turning white beneath her gauntlets. All you have to offer is madness and lies. I prayed that I could come here to save my friend, but I see now that she has been dead for some time. Mirabelle released her hold on the chained sister and sighed. A pity, but not unexpected. Kill them, she commanded. Everyone dashed to cover and opened fire as both loyal and traitor sisters engaged one another. Uriel, motivated by holy wrath, unleashed a torrent of flame that snaked out to wrap around one of Mirabelle's traitor sisters. She dropped to her knees with a scream, her corrupted body writhing in agony. The two remaining traitor sisters focused their fire on Uriel, their bolter rounds cutting through the hostile air. A lucky shot struck the Promethean tank on Uriel's back, causing it to explode with devastating force. The blast sent everyone tumbling to the floor, the shockwave reverberating through the sanctum but it only took heartbeats for everyone to drag themselves back up and start shooting at each other again, undeterred by the fiery pools of Prometheum that burned around them. Mirabelle drew her power sword and charged at Sister Serafina, who was still struggling to get up. With a swift, deadly strike, she aimed to behead the loyalist sister. But Serafina managed to raise her weapon just in time to deflect the lethal blow. Mirabelle threw herself at Serafina again, her relentless assault threatening to overwhelm her opponent. This time, Serafina was ready, using every ounce of her strength to parry Mirabelle's blows. Then their two weapons locked, and the power sword's energy field cleaved through the chainsword's teeth, sending metal shards clattering to the floor. Serafina followed up with a kick that sent Mirabelle staggering back. Lucia and Octavia, shielded by one of the pillars, peeked out only to fire their bolters at the traitor sisters. The deadly exchanges of fire continued as they tried to outmaneuver each other. Mirabelle, with a wicked smile on her lips, sprang forward to slam into Serafina, her power sword clashing with Serafina's chainsword once more. But this time she leant forward and spat like a poisonous snake, a thick unnatural mucus into Serafina's eyes. Blinded, Serafina tumbled backwards, dropping her weapon and clawing at the sticky glue like substance that burned her eyes and face. With her opponent temporarily incapacitated, Mirabelle seized the opportunity and prepared to deliver the killing blow. Serafina! Sister Octavia yelled, her voice filled with desperation. She sprinted from cover towards Serafina, firing her bolter at Mirabelle in a desperate attempt to protect her comrade. Lucia followed Octavia's lead, providing covering fire as she raced to the rescue. A well-aimed bolter round hit one of the traitor sisters in the head, causing it to explode like an overripe watermelon. Mirabelle, displaying unnatural grace, danced through the storm of bolter fire from Octavia. She sliced up with her power sword and cut Octavia's bolter in half. 
Then, with all the grace of a ballerina, she span around and kicked Octavia, sending her flying back to crash into a pillar with bone-rattling force. Mirabelle's deranged laughter echoed through the grand hall, a cruel symphony of madness. Lucia rolled to the side and fired her bolter, taking out the last remaining traitor sister. She drew her own power sword and prepared to face her former friend one last time. Mirabelle, let's finish this, you and me, Lucia cried, her voice unwavering. Mirabelle turned to face Lucia, her gaze filled with the sadistic pleasure of battle. Silly girl, you never could beat me, little Lulu, she taunted, her words dripping with malice. Lucia winced at the sound of her childhood nickname, a term of endearment long ago, now twisted by betrayal on the lips of a traitor. Talk less, fight more, Lucia hissed through gritted teeth. They moved skillfully, sidestepping and circling each other among puddles of still-burning Prometheum. Mirabelle's movements were erratic and unpredictable, reflecting the madness that had consumed her. She lunged with a vicious thrust at Lucia's chest, but Lucia sidestepped the deadly strike by a hair's breadth. Mirabelle leant towards her and spat, but Lucia was expecting it, and easily ducked out of the way. With every ounce of determination, Lucia pressed her assault, her strikes growing more aggressive. She aimed a powerful overhead swing at Mirabelle, but the traitor dodged the blow. Lucia staggered forward, thrown off balance by the force of her own strike. Mirabelle seized the opportunity and lunged forward with her power sword. Lucia abruptly dropped to the ground. She grabbed one of Mirabelle's legs and pulled with all her might. Mirabelle toppled to the floor beside her, and in one movement, Lucia rolled over and plunged the blade of her power sword into Mirabelle. The sword went through her traitorous form and deep into the marble floor beneath. Mirabelle spasmed and then was still. Sister Octavia limped over, supported by Sister Serafina, her vision slowly clearing as the mucus was cleared from her eyes. Lucia stood up and retrieved her sword. Suffer not the traitor to live, she said, and with a single unflinching stroke decapitated her former friend. She turned to face Octavia and Serafina and motioned to the sisters still chained to the pillars. Our true sisters need us, she continued. Find any that still draw breath and vox the Thunderhawk for immediate pickup. We've delivered the Emperor's judgment. Let's take our sisters and go home. The Martyr's Path Marcella staggered into the abandoned cathedral, panting and wild-eyed. The fear and desperation surging through his veins gave him the strength to push the enormous oversized doors closed behind him. They were coming, and they probably weren't far behind. Marcellus's mind raced as he locked his eyes on the door and slowly backed away, anticipating the moment they would burst in and end his life. The once huge and ornate stained glass windows, which had bathed the great hall in vibrant light, were now nothing but shattered, jagged shards. They had once depicted the benevolence of the god-emperor and his loyal sons, but never again would anyone be able to gaze upon their splendor. Fallen masonry and toppled statues lay in broken pieces across the central aisle. A few had come to rest atop broken pews where they had fallen, their forms now shattered and twisted. As he backed away, Marcella stumbled over one such statue, that of St. Pallone the Pious, and fell backwards onto the cold stone slab floor with a crash. He lay there for a moment, stunned and afraid, listening to the echoes of his own ragged breaths. Eventually, coming to his senses, he crawled, on his hands and knees, to a gap between two pews, where he curled into the fetal position and silently sobbed. For many years, Father Marcellus had served on the imperial world of Vetage Alpha, tending to the faithful. He led sermons in a small church adjacent to one of the city's many manufacturums. It had been a simple but pleasant life. He often told his congregation of the evil that lay out there, in the stars. And now that evil was here, here, and intent on cruelty and murder. As the night stretched on, Marcellus heard screams in the distance, the sound of yet more innocents being butchered. Eventually he couldn't take any more, and he rose from his hiding place and began to walk through the cathedral, his footsteps echoing through the otherwise silent hall. A faint glow came from a stasis field on the distant main altar, but it only cast a dim light that was difficult to see by. 
Marcellus found a candle and lit it using a lighter from his satchel. The flickering candlelight cast long shadows across the ancient walls. The darkness around him seemed to press in from all sides, like tendrils of fear and despair that threatened to suffocate him in darkness and death. He placed the candle on the floor and squatted down next to the illusion of safety its fragile light offered. Checking himself for injuries, he was surprised to see that his white priestly robes were covered in blood. As he patted himself down, searching for a wound, Marcellus came to the grim realization that it wasn't his. Poor brother Julius, Marcellus thought, as tears welled in his eyes and rolled down his ash-covered face. Julius had been running beside him as they fled, with a dozen or so others, from a band of heretics. The heretics' bolters belched out savage booms that echoed over the chaos of the shouts and wails of the streets. One moment Julius was there, and the next he was gone, bursting like a crimson-filled balloon, leaving nothing but a sickening explosion of gore and the wretched scent of burnt flesh where he had once been. It had happened so fast. Julius hadn't even had enough time to let out a scream, a small mercy for which Marcellus was grateful to the emperor. In his panic, Marcellus had kept running and hadn't stopped until he reached the Cathedral of Enduring Devotion. He hadn't dared to look back to see what had happened to the others. He was too afraid he'd catch sight of the heretics again and collapse in despair. Just thinking of the abominations, clad in their obsidian black ceramite armor, adorned with all manner of garish and twisted symbolism of the profane, filled Marcellus with such fear that his legs felt weak, so he leant against a pew to steady himself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang from behind him. Marcellus jumped and let out a panicked whimper. He turned to face the source of the noise, holding the candle out in front of him like a talisman of protection. There was another bang followed by a thud, thud, hiss. The noise echoed from the altar, a distant cacophony that sent shivers down Marcellus's spine. With a pop, the noises ceased as abruptly as they had started, and the stasis field that glowed over the great altar winked out of existence. Marcellus's breath came in ragged, fearful gasps as he approached the altar to investigate. As he walked, the shadows cast by his flickering candle seemed to writhe and twist at the edge of his vision like malevolent spirits. The shadowy, obscured faces of the lofty statues he passed under seemed to gaze down on him in silent disapproval. Marcellus quickened his pace his heart hammering in his chest as the darkness closed in around him and he stumbled over some broken masonry. Then a jagged piece of twisted metal that protruded from a broken statue snagged on the corner of his robe. He tore it free with a piercing rip and carried on. He reached the steps at the foot of the large altar and cautiously went up. Once at the top, for the briefest of moments, all of Marcellus's fears and doubts were cast aside. His candle illuminated a small figure carved from wood of extreme age, its worn yet delicate features a testament to the outstanding craftsmanship of an unknown and long-dead artisan. As his eyes fell upon the effigy of the god-emperor, the entire chamber was filled with a sense of peace and reverence. Marcellus fell to his knees, overwhelmed by the sacredness of the moment. Setting down the candle, Marcellus lowered his head and made the sign of the aquila, a symbol of faith and devotion to the god-emperor of mankind. Only once had he been privileged enough to see an emperator Iconus, and that had been from a great distance, when one had been carried in a grand parade sealed within a gilded coffer. To be in the presence of such a sacred artifact, so close he could touch it, felt almost sacrilegious. His heart raced, and his palms grew sweaty with a mixture of awe and guilt. Thousands of years ago, before the Emperor's light had remade Vetage Alpha, it had been a brutal feudal world ruled over by a tyrannical high king that worshipped archaic ancestral idols. St. Helena of the Orders Sabine had come from the stars to teach the backward savages of this world, but the high king had refused to believe her and the imperial truth she brought. To stop the spread of the true and rightful faith, the high king built a huge pyre. He had Helena burned alive atop it for all to see. As she burned at the stake, St. Helena's voice rose above the crackling flames. She did not scream or beg for mercy, but instead proclaimed the Emperor's love for the Vetage people, her words ringing through the air with a holy power. The High King's heinous deed had the opposite effect, and the imperial truth of St. Helena spread to every corner of the world. Two hundred years later, an imperial fleet appeared in orbit above Vetage Alpha. 
As the ships descended through the atmosphere, the people below looked up in wonder and awe. The streets were filled with the sound of joyful cries and prayers of thanks for the long, prophesied time was at hand. The world in its entirety was already dedicated to the emperor of mankind. Being able to finally join his imperium was met with great jubilation. According to scripture, not all of the wood of St. Helena's pyre was consumed, and ten effigies of the emperor were carved from what was saved. Now only three remain, preserved in stasis fields to protect them from the ravages of time. Marcellus now knelt before one such Imperator Iconus. Somewhere outside, a distant explosion shook the cathedral. As undeserving as he was, he couldn't leave one of the most holy of holy relics to be abandoned in such a dangerous place. Marcellus prayed. He prayed for his world. He prayed for Brother Julius. But mostly he prayed for forgiveness for his abject unworthiness. His self-denigration finally ended when another explosion rang out, closer this time. It shook the cathedral so hard that two more statues toppled and smashed onto the floor. Marcellus tore the cleanest part of his robe he could find and tenderly wrapped the wooden statuette in it. It wasn't particularly heavy, and the ancient wood felt more like rough-cut stone than lumber. All done, the bundle was about fifteen inches long and fit snugly into his satchel after he had tipped out all of its other contents. With the statuette securely wrapped and safely stowed, Marcellus retrieved the candle and carefully descended the steps from the altar. Outside, the crack of bolter fire resonated around the ancient walls of the cathedral, a sound Marcellus instantly recognized, causing him to flinch with each boom. He knew he had to move quickly if he wanted to survive. He scanned the great hall and saw a small door beside a large organ. Marcellus rushed to it, blew out his candle, and with a deep breath, he stepped through into the darkness, leaving the temporary sanctuary of the great hall behind. Once his eyes adjusted to the darkness, Marcellus realized that the door led to a series of cloisters, each separated by a door like the one he had passed through. He moved as briskly as he could, spurred on by the echoes of bolter fire and shouting. His progress came to a stop when he came to a locked door that refused to yield despite his desperate shoves. He pulled frantically at the handle, but the door wouldn't budge. Fearing that a heretic might shoot him in the back at any moment, Marcellus kicked at the door in wild frustration, his foot connecting with a resounding thud, and there was a startled gasp from the other side. Marcellus froze, his heart pounding in his chest as he strained to hear anything else from beyond the door. But there was only suffocating silence. Hello, is someone there? He eventually whispered. But he was met with only more silence. Do not be afraid. My name is Father Marcellus, he continued. I'm a priest from District 11. It's not safe here. The great enemy. They're here, in the cathedral. We need to go. There was a hushed exchange behind the door, the whispering voices barely audible through the thick wood. Then, after a moment that felt like an eternity, a heavy bolt clunked aside and the door creaked open. Inside was a small room with a group of people cowering behind boxes and old-looking gardening tools. There was an old woman, a child clinging to her skirt, and four others dressed in grimy laborers' overalls. Once they took in the sight of Marcellus in the doorway, they recoiled and backed away. It wasn't the reaction he was expecting. Their pale faces were difficult to make out by the dim light of the small blue glow globe that illuminated the room. But their terror was plain for Marcellus to see, and it took him a moment to realize what was wrong. Marcellus looked desperate, perhaps even unhinged, and his once white robes were now despoiled with blood and gore. He realized with a shock that he resembled the crazed fanatics who had turned away from the emperor's light to worship the accursed false gods of the heretics. He didn't have time for this, Marcellus thought. He needed to get out of here before those ceramite monsters found him, and he ended up like Brother Julius. Realizing that the doorway led to a storage room and not a safe way out, he considered running on and leaving these people to their fate. He wanted to, but the weight of the Imperator Iconus weighed heavy on his shoulders, and he reconsidered. He placed a hand on his satchel and took a deep breath to compose himself. Do not be afraid. Forgive my appearance, for I am what I say. I have been through much this night, as I'm sure you all have. But we have little time. He explained. Please, we must leave this place. The enduring devotion isn't safe. As if to emphasize his point, there was a loud explosion, 
followed by a deafening crash. It sounded as if the roof of the cathedral's main hall had collapsed, sending debris raining down to pummel what was left of the main hall. Reflexively, Marcellus crouched, and the child let out a scream. A man in overalls with a jagged scar running down his face surged to his feet. He took up a garden hoe and pointed it towards Marcellus like a spear. His voice was low and gravelly as he spoke. We're safer in here than out there, he said, waving the hoe around menacingly. If you want to leave, be my guest, but don't expect us to follow you. I know this is difficult, but if you stay here, you'll all be killed. Please come. They've taken this whole area. They're looking for... I appreciate your concern, father, the scarred man interrupted with a snarl. We're good right here. This is the emperor's house, and the emperor protects. Perhaps he sent me here to take you to safety, Marcellus said weakly. He didn't believe it himself, but he hoped he sounded more convincing than he felt. Enough, close and bolt it, the scarred man growled. The old woman started to close the door when Marcellus jammed his foot in the way. Please, old mother, Marcellus pleaded as he reached out a hand to her and the child. Put your faith in the emperor. There is nowhere to run hiding here. You'll be trapped. Let's leave this place, together. The old woman hesitated at first, then nodded and placed her trembling hand in his. He gently pulled her outside, with the child following along behind her with two of the laborers. As soon as they were outside, the door was slammed shut with a bang of resounding finality. The heavy bolt was slid back into place, leaving them alone in the dark cloister. Marcellus's eyes flickered around. His chest felt tight, and a wave of uncertainty washed over him. People were following him now, but he had no idea where he was supposed to lead them. It was then that the old woman, sensing his dilemma, softly squeezed his hand, drawing his attention to her. The old woman's face was etched with deep lines, evidence of a long, hard life, but her eyes were alert and sharp. There is a way out in the kitchens, she said in a dry and wheezy voice, pointing towards the direction they should go. It's used to bring in the produce. Marcellus's heart lifted at the old woman's words. A small grateful smile flickered across his face as he motioned for the group to follow him. As they approached the kitchen, Marcellus could hear screams, gunfire, and the sound of steel crashing against steel. The conflict was drawing closer, and every step they took seemed to bring it nearer. Marcellus knew they had to find a way out soon, or they would be trapped in the cathedral with no chance of escape. They reached the kitchen door, which Marcellus slowly opened. It creaked slightly as it swung inward, and Marcellus peered inside. The kitchen smelt of centuries of use, like an old drawer used to keep spices in, and looked to be in a total shambles. Pots and pans were strewn across the floor, and food was spilled everywhere. Suddenly, a figure holding a knife loomed out of the shadows towards Marcellus, who threw up his hands. As the figure stepped closer, Marcellus saw that it was one of the cathedral's cooks, a burly man with large muscular arms and a crooked nose that looked as if it had been broken more than once. The cook brandished the blade in a tight, white-knuckled grip. Who's there? he barked, his voice intimidating and suspicious. Marcellus stepped forward, his hands held up in a gesture of peace. We're not here to cause any trouble, Marcellus said, trying to make his tone as calm and non-threatening as possible. We're just looking for a way out. The cook hesitated, glancing warily between Marcellus and the group of survivors that filed into the kitchen behind him. Then he seemed to relax and lowered the knife. Throne, what are you still doing here, Gert? Everyone else is gone, the cook said gruffly when he recognized the old woman. Gertrude shrugged with a wry smile. You know me, always the slowest, she said. We're getting out through the back. Come with us. There's safety in numbers. Marcellus added quickly, his voice urgent. The cook reluctantly agreed with a nod. Fine, he said. Not much point staying here anymore. The six of them hurried through a door at the back of the kitchen, away from the fragrant room and down a long hallway. The hallway, so narrow they had to run single file, led to a garden area. It was a modest courtyard surrounded by high brick walls. Eight identical plant beds were arranged in neat rows, from which sprouted flowering vegetables that reached skyward on spindly green stalks, as if in homage to the four spiralling corner towers of the cathedral that pointed towards distant terror, where the god-emperor sat eternal on his golden throne. In the centre of the garden a fountain bubbled flanked by a solitary stone bench. 
Despite Marcellus's frantic search, it seemed like this was a dead end, with no visible exit. Where's the door? Where's the exit? Marcellus panicked. Well, there isn't one as such, the old woman explained wryly. They normally toss the produce and stuff over the wall. Then how do we get out through here? Marcellus asked, his hope of a timely escape quickly evaporating like the morning mist in the midday sun. Gertrude motioned over to the weathered bench, and the cook hefted it up with gritted teeth, his muscles bulging under his tunic. With a grunt, he dropped it next to the wall, creating a makeshift step. We'll hop over the wall, Gertrude mused, a hint of nostalgia in her voice. We used to do it to spend a couple of hours in the city back in the day. That was a long time ago, so if you wouldn't mind giving an old woman a hand. The moment they realized there was a way out, the two laborers sprung into action, their movements fluid and swift. With muscles honed by years of hard toil, they sprinted onto the bench and vaulted over the wall, their bodies momentarily silhouetted against a distant explosion of ordnance somewhere in the city. Marcellus felt a surge of relief wash over him. The Emperor provides all we need if only we have the wisdom to see it. Marcellus quoted, and once more made the sign of the Aquila. The cook confidently stomped onto the bench, and the child clambered up his back like a monkey scaling a tree. Gertrude struggled onto the bench next, where she was half lifted, half thrown, over the wall by the burly man. Your next preacher, the cook said. His matter-of-fact tone cut through any thought of objection as he interlocked his fingers to offer up a boost. With a short sprint and the boost up, Marcellus propelled himself to the top of the wall. He balanced precariously at the top and looked back behind him. What about you? he asked. Oh, don't worry about me. I've got this, the big man said, and jumped up to grab the top of the wall with his large, powerful hands. He grunted and huffed as he tried to pull himself up, but couldn't quite manage it. He tried to brace himself against the wall, but his feet slipped, and he fell down with a curse. Take my hand, Marcellus said, as he braced himself at the top of the wall and reached down to him. I hope you've got a strong arm. The cook panted. Emperor, give me strength, Marcellus prayed. Marcellus was not a particularly athletic man, and the cook was without a doubt heavy set, but he was determined to give it all he had. The cook jumped up, and one of his big meaty hands clamped down on Marcellus's, which was dainty and petite by comparison. Reaching down with his other hand, Marcellus strained to lift him up two-handed. His biceps, unaccustomed to such exertion, reeled in pain at the intense effort. Finally, with a roar of triumph and exertion, the cook was hauled slowly upwards, inch by torturous inch. Bam! With a crack like thunder, the cook's body shattered in a crimson eruption of bloodied body parts that splattered in all directions. Marcellus felt the arm he was pulling tear away from what was left of the mangled torso, causing him to be propelled backwards off the wall. Time seemed to slow as he sailed through the air, the world spinning around him in a nauseating blur. His mind struggled to comprehend the horror of what had happened. Then, in a moment of jarring clarity, he caught a fleeting glimpse of an obsidian black armored heretic in the cathedral garden. Then he was gone, out of sight, as Marcellus tumbled behind the wall and away from the gruesome scene. He hit the ground on the other side with such teeth rattling force that the air was punched out of him. Marcellus struggled to regain his bearings. Everything looked fuzzy with white stars that popped and whizzed across his vision like sanguinalia fireworks. His ears rung with a high pitched whine that drowned out everything else. He wasn't sure if it was the result of the fall, the proximity to a bolt round detonation or both, and it didn't matter either way. All that mattered was survival. Marcellus's drive for self preservation kicked in, and an inner voice told him to get up and keep moving. Dazed and disoriented, he lurched unsteadily to his feet, swaying back and forth on wobbly legs. Go, 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 run, he slurred, unable to hear himself over the crescendo of ringing in his ears. Driven by their desperation and terror, the survivors of the Cathedral of Enduring Devotion fled away from the certainty of death and towards the uncertainty of the surrounding war-ravaged city. Message in the Dark Loyalty to the Emperor is paramount. Would you obey no matter the cost, or is there a line you would not cross? The Inquisitor asked. By the dim light of the private office, he was very intimidating. I, I, I'm a loyal guardsman. I swore an oath to defend the Imperium, no matter the cost, I stammered. 
He pushed a blank piece of paper across the desk in front of me. He fixed me with his steely gaze before speaking again. I want to understand why you are standing here, when so many others are not. I want a full report. Start from the beginning and be thorough, as if your life depends on it, because it very well may. Yesterday was my first deployment to active duty. The hive city of Acheron had been under relentless assault by the forces of chaos and corruption for months. Those infected with the walking pox would smash against the hive like a living wave, leaving destruction and death in their wake. They were always repelled, but each time they pushed deeper into the hive. I left the forward command post for the front lines by a transport. I was nervous and felt like I was going to be sick all over my new boots, but I tried not to let it show. I repeated the guard primers in my head, and I told myself I was ready for whatever lay ahead. The brakes on the ramshackle transport screeched as it came to an abrupt halt. The twenty or thirty other fresh-faced youths in the hold all lurched to the front to fall into a disheveled human pile. I had just managed to drag myself out of the press of bodies when the doors opened and I was pushed outside. I was momentarily blinded as the twin sons of Maron Prime were at their summit, and it took a moment for my eyes to adjust. Hive Acheron loomed behind us, a sprawling mountain of steel and rockcrete, set in a barren desert of sand and baked earth. It was a stark contrast to the serene landscapes I'd known back on my home world. I was from a green, agri world that had never felt as distant as it did at that moment. Everything around me was in hectic disarray. Three massive artillery cannons, their barrels longer than the transport we'd been crammed into, roared to life with deafening booms that made the ground shake each time they hurtled ordnance toward distant enemy positions. In the midst of the commotion, officers in ornate hats barked orders and herded soldiers into formations, their voices laden with authority and urgency. There were civilians, too, dressed in overalls or ragged old clothes, as every able body was being marshaled to stand against the relentless assault of the walking pox that blighted Marin Prime. They toiled frantically to dig trenches or piled up sandbags with grim determination. Sergeant Cale Drayton, a grizzled veteran with a jagged scar across one eye, noticed me and waved me over. He stood tall with a striking presence that exuded the confidence of a veteran soldier. He looked like he belonged on a recruitment poster, his stern, chiseled features framed by closely cropped greying hair that added an air of wisdom and experience to his imposing figure. His deep, resonant voice was often the source of encouragement, providing solace to young soldiers who had never before tasted the horrors of war. He had taken a shine to me when he realized we came from the same far-off agri-world. Our imperial tithe was largely paid in grain and grocks, so there wasn't many of us that had enlisted. It turned out he was from the equator while I was from the northern continent, about 4,000 miles away. But in galactic terms, it was like being from the same hometown. I'm not afraid to admit that he was something of a hero to me. He'd been my mentor in basic training, the one who'd molded me into a soldier. I owed my life to him, and I admired his unwavering dedication to the Imperium. Thorn, you made it, he said, his voice barely audible over the cacophony of artillery fire and shouting, about time. We're stretched thin, but we've got a fighting chance. This is where you'll prove yourself, lad. He led me to where I'd be stationed, then gave me a hearty slap on the back that was a tad too firm, and I stumbled forward. We sent them packing before and we'll do it again. Remember what I taught you and you'll be just fine. Don't piss your pants and the first round's on me. He winked at me, made the sign of the Aquila, and left to attend to his other duties. My trench was near a sewage outlet for the expansive slums that formed the base of the Hive City. It was a long, hastily dug line, five foot deep with rough, uneven walls of poorly packed soil. Bulging sacks of sand and grit had been piled up at regular intervals by the desperate defenders for them to stand on to shoot over the top. Inside was a mixture of soldiers, ranging from experienced veterans to raw recruits like myself. Among them, I recognized a few familiar faces from my training squad. Sophia Renwick, a skilled marksman even at her young age, had a quiet determination in her eyes. She gave me a silent reassuring nod that I returned. She had an uncanny ability to keep her cool under fire, and I'd learned a lot from her during training. Beside her was Grizz. He was a hulking figure whose arms were thicker than my legs. He was a jovial giant, quick with a joke to ease the tension. 
Lastly was Eleanor, a friendly girl with auburn hair and a distinctive pattern of burn scars on one side of her face. We would often joke together about how bad the rations were. Not when any of the officers or commissars could hear, of course. And now all of us were stationed together for our first deployment, defending Acheron. It felt like we were imperial heroes from some hollow vid. Sergeant Drayton reappeared and put a las gun in my hands. Then I took my place on the line with all the others. I'm not sure if it was the reassuring heft of the weapon in my hands or being side by side with people I knew, but I didn't feel sick anymore. I actually felt ready. I had to trust in what Drayton had taught me, trust that I would act when the time came, and trust everyone else down the trench would do the same. And I did. So we readied ourselves and waited. Time stretched on, and eventually the suns dipped below the distant horizon, casting long shadows that mingled with the chill of the approaching night. As we huddled in the darkness of the trench, a heavy silence hung over us. I suppose each of us was lost in their own thoughts. Even the heavy artillery paused in its unrelenting bombardment and fell quiet for a time. Above, Marin Prime's solitary moon cast its silvery glow over the barren expanse of desert, lending an eerie, ethereal quality to the desolation. I'd never consider deserts to be pretty, but it was, in its own way. We scanned the horizon, our eyes tracing the shimmering dunes of the hauntingly still wasteland that stretched out before us. Sophia shouted a sighting from further up the line. I squinted, and I saw for myself a scene that will haunt my nightmares. From the edge of the horizon, like a surreal nightmare given life, they emerged. An endless sea of twisted abominations, their bloated, pustule-ridden bodies moving with eerie, mindless determination. The desert, once a desolate canvas of sand, was now tainted by the presence of a seething mass of corruption and disease. The pox walkers, each a grotesque echo of a former human life, shuffled forward. The dread they emanated almost palpable. Their eyes, what remained of them, glowed with a malevolence as they fixed their unholy gazes on our trench, where my fellow soldiers and I waited. I tightened my grip on my las gun as my bravado began to evaporate at the sight of the enemy, and the cold, heavy fear returned to the pit of my stomach. I jumped as the artillery once again boomed to life behind me. Explosions erupted amongst the sea of infected and lit the battlefield with brief, brilliant bursts of red and yellow. Pox walkers were blasted up into the air by the shelling to rain back down as broken human pieces. A cheer went up along the trench and I actually laughed, confident in the superiority of our big guns. But I underestimated the sheer numbers and tenacity of the enemy. Regardless of how many were pulverized by the shelling, the rest just kept coming. They seemed to dance with malevolent glee as they drew nearer, their emaciated limbs swaying in surreal harmony as they advanced, as if the violent explosive bombardment was nothing more than a dazzling firework display to welcome them to some grand celebration. The direction of the wind changed, and the air became thick with the stench of decay, a nauseating mixture of rotting flesh and gunpowder. If I hadn't actually witnessed it myself, I don't think I would have believed the true horror of the walking pox. Their bodies were riddled with injuries and disease that by all logical accounts should have killed them all long ago. Yet they moved onward, inexorable and unyielding. Struggling to accept what I saw, I slapped my own face. I suppose I was hoping it was just a bad dream, but my stinging face told me the horror in front of me was all too real. The unholy chorus of the oncoming poxwalkers, with their unnerving cries, grew louder than the cacophony of artillery barrages. Their moans and groans seemed to claw their way into the darkest corners of my mind, sending shivers down my spine and raising the fine hairs on the back of my neck. My heart pounded in my chest, and I fidgeted nervously my weapon suddenly feeling unfamiliar, like a foreign presence in my trembling hands. Take aim! I heard Sergeant Drayton's commanding voice bellow out from somewhere behind me. I diligently did as I was told, and got into a firing position, grateful to be doing something at last. I looked down the sights of my las gun. There were so many poxwalkers crowded together, their gnarled hands outstretched and grasping for their next victim, that it was near impossible to miss. Fire! I pulled the trigger in actual battle for the first time. It spat red beams of death towards the enemy, each bolt burning deep holes in their bloated and rotten bodies. Despite the grievous wounds I inflicted, the poxwalkers were disgustingly resilient, 
ignoring wounds that would have killed a regular man. But with enough shots I felled my first infected. I gasped and realized that I had been holding my breath the whole time. I took a deep breath and went back to work. I fired until my power pack ran dry. I replaced it with the spare and kept blasting at the poxwalkers. But despite the incredible losses they suffered, their advance didn't even slow. Fix bayonets, Sergeant Drayton ordered, as with grim inevitability they reached us. They enveloped our position like a tide of filth and decay. Their rotting hands reached out, grasping for any shred of life, their revolting faces twisted with an unearthly hunger. With a cry of defiance, I lanced one with my bayonet and kicked it away. Then a second dropped down, and a third dropped down on top of that, knocking it down. I jabbed at them both as they lay sprawled on top of each other. Then I spared a fleeting glance down the trench at my comrades. Sophia's sharp shooting skills were useless in the close quarters combat. She got some good shots off, but a pox walker, with half its head blown off, swatted her las gun aside and barreled into her. It sank its talon like shriveled fingers into her flesh, and she screamed. Grizz turned his las gun around and, holding it by the barrel, swung it like a club as he ran towards her. With his sheer strength, he cracked open skulls like they were over ripened fruit. But within moments, the trench was choked full of pox walkers, and there wasn't enough room to swing. Sophia disappeared beneath a pile of attackers, and Grizz reached out to her. Sophia, he called before a dozen clawed hands and biting teeth silenced him forever. I didn't have the chance to see what happened to Eleanor as I became surrounded and had to fight for my own life. A guardsman I didn't know next to me threw his las gun at the infected and tried to flee. He managed to climb halfway out the trench before a bolt shot from our rear lines struck him and he fell back into the trench, dead. As the pox walkers pressed against me, I tried to back up and tripped over the lifeless body of a fallen soldier. I fell and my las gun slipped from my hands to land just out of reach. Panic welled up within me as I fumbled for anything I could use as a weapon. My trembling hand closed around a grenade, still clutched tightly in the stiff fingers of the guardsman I had fallen over. With no time to think, I took it and hurled the explosive towards the approaching abominations. It bounced off of them to land somewhere out of sight. A pox walker reached out and clawed deeply into my leg, then the grenade unleashed the Emperor's fury and exploded. The resulting shockwave must have hit a weakness in the hastily constructed earthen fortifications. The walls of that entire section of trench crumbled and collapsed in an avalanche of dirt and debris that buried everything, including me. Eventually I regained my senses, but everything was silent and black. I felt hot and I couldn't move. Was I dead? Is this what death is like? I thought. I coughed and spat out a mouth full of bitter-tasting soil. The fleeting rush of elation when I realized I was still alive was quickly replaced with panic when I understood I had been buried alive in a mass grave. My breath came in short, desperate draws, the tight press of earth preventing me from sucking in a whole lungful of the stale air from the small air pocket I was apparently trapped in. Unsure how I was still alive, but knowing I wouldn't stay that way for long, my heart pounded in my chest as I fought to break free. At first, nothing happened. My feeble attempts at motion were useless as the weight of the earth pressed down on me. My limbs ached with the effort, but, desperate to live, I kept going, and slowly my arms started to move from where they were pinned. I managed to pull my left arm into the small pocket my head, and part of my torso was in, and started clawing desperately at the earth above me. With a final surge of strength, I forced myself upwards and burst through the surface and into the morning light of Maron Prime's twin suns. I greedily gulped in the taste of sweet fresh air, then flopped to the side exhausted, still buried from the waist down. Once I caught my breath, I extracted myself completely and dusted myself off. I was covered in grime and filth, my uniform torn and muddied, but I was alive. I looked around and saw the battle was long since over. Dead pox walkers and soldiers were strewn all over the place. Hello, anyone, I shouted, but there was no reply. Then I noticed it. Not far from where I had pulled myself from the collapsed trench, the soil rhythmically pulsed. I dived over and began to dig with my bare hands. My fingers scraped against the soil, and I could hear the muffled sounds of groaning below. Hang in there, I've almost got you. I dug harder, uncovering the green uniform of a fellow guardsman. I got a firm grip on the collar of their uniform and pulled, but as the head broke the surface, 
I reeled back in horror. It was the bloated and ghastly head of a poxwalker, its face twisting as it gnashed its teeth at me in a ravenous frenzy. I picked up a nearby rock in both hands and brought it crushing down on the exposed thing's skull. I hit it over and over until its desperate attempts to bite me with its snapping jaws finally ceased. I dropped the bloodied stone and staggered away, looking for signs of other survivors amidst the ruins of the trench, being more wary of any bodies that could be newly infected. It looked like the collapse was localized to where I'd been fighting, but the rest of the line was filled with the bodies of the dead. My heart skipped a beat when I recognized the familiar form of Sergeant Drayton slumped against an outcrop. I rushed to his side. He was badly injured, and I gently patted his shoulder. Sergeant? I whispered, my voice trembling with concern. I feared he was dead, and a wave of relief washed over me when he slowly opened his eyes. He turned to me. His gaze was distant, as if he were peering through me, but his movements were human, not the rabid jerks of the infected. Thorn, Thorn, is that you? He asked, his voice weak and filled with disbelief. Yes, yes, it's me, I replied, overjoyed. He reached over and touched my face. How? How are you still alive? The trench collapsed, I began. We were fighting. A poxer was about to bite my face off when the whole thing fell in. I just managed to pull myself out. He chuckled weakly. Ha! I knew you wouldn't run. You're a good kid. I guess it's true when they say you can't keep a good grower down. Sergeant, where is everyone? He sighed and motioned to the trench's grim surroundings. Dead or pulled back. You, my boy, are the last man standing. I shook my head. You and me both. No, not me. I'm afraid my standing days are done, he said somberly. Don't be like that, I protested, attempting to help him up. But when I tried, he howled in pain and I quickly released him. I hesitated, not sure what to do. Top pocket, Drayton said. I unbuttoned the top pocket of his fatigues and handed him the notepad and pen that were inside. He quickly began to write something down, tore off the page, and folded it up before handing me the note. Listen to me, Thorn. I need you to do something for me. This is the last order I'll ever give you. This message is of vital importance. You need to get it to the forward command post. There is an inquisitor there by the name of Galen. It's for his eyes only. Understand? He said. But Sergeant, I began, my voice choked with emotion. But before I could finish, Drayton cut me off. Do you understand? This is an order, guardsman. Sir, yes, sir. I relented. You're a good soldier. Make me proud. Tears welled in my eyes, and I wiped them away with a dirty sleeve. I will. I will, I promise, I said, as the light of life faded from his eyes. I offered a prayer for his immortal soul, tears flowing freely down my face. He was a great man, and had died an imperial martyr. I knew he'd be by the emperor's side, watching down on me, and I was determined to honor his memory by carrying out his final orders, or die trying. I stuffed the note in my pocket and found a las gun with half a charge still left. With the almost unbearable weight of loss and responsibility, I made my way into the slums of the underhive. The edge of the slums were open to the sky, but were cloaked in a thick layer of smog that made the filth-covered streets dark and dingy, even at this time of day. The narrow walkways and boulevards that had been a bustling hub of human activity when I passed through on my way to the front had become a desolate wasteland the loud and rowdy streets as hushed as a mausoleum. The towering, dilapidated buildings loomed like monuments to human desperation, their haphazard silhouettes casting elongated skeletal shadows across the crumbling pavement. Their walls were scarred by laz fire and blood splatters. I scanned every window and doorway I passed with my raised laz gun. It didn't take me long to start encountering the dead. It was more like a walk through the slaughterhouse of an abattoir than an imperial city. The twisted remnants of humanity, soldier and civilian, young and old, were strewn about in contorted poses like forgotten dolls in a child's nightmare. Some had died in futile attempts to fend off the poxwalkers, while others had succumbed to the plague with silent despair. I tried to step carefully over and amongst the mangled corpses, giving an even wider berth to those that could be infected for fear they might reanimate and leap up to sink their teeth into me. Eventually, I reached the underhive proper. It was like going underground with only the faint glow of flickering lumens to eerily light the way. Suddenly a subtle scuttling drew my attention. I spun in a panicked reflex, 
my lasgun's beam lancing out in an iridescent fury. The rat thing, about three foot long with two tails, disintegrated into a lump of scorched fur and bone. The stench of burnt rodent hair, hardly noticeable over the acrid odor of the underhive's decay. I tried to hurry on, but got tangled up in the disemboweled innards of an unfortunate underhiver as their entrails got wrapped around a boot. I tried to kick them off, but slipped on the blood-soaked floor and fell to land face to face with a dead woman. Her lifeless eyes bore into me in silent accusation. It was my job to keep them safe, and I had failed them. I had failed all of them. I jumped back up to my feet and rushed away. I didn't look back and tried not to think about all the lives that had ended so brutally all around me. Up ahead I heard the sound of tearing and ripping just around the corner. I thought it might be another one of those rat things, but taking no chances I decided to cautiously scout it out first. My heart sank as I peered around a corner and saw a large group of poxwalkers. Their vile, bloated figures huddled around a banquet of guardsmen's remains. The macabre feasting was accompanied by sickening wet sounds as they tore into flesh and gnawed on bones with unnerving determination. My throat tightened with revulsion. Lucky for me the poxwalkers were oblivious to everything but their ghoulish feast and hadn't noticed me. There were too many of them for me to handle alone, so I decided to look for another way to the command post. As quietly as I could, I backed away, afraid that even the slightest noise or sudden movement could draw their attention. I tried my best to navigate the unfamiliar labyrinth of the underhive. My lasgun remained at the ready, my trembling finger on the trigger. I turned another corner and onto a thoroughfare with stalls selling various foods, skewered on sticks or wrapped in some kind of grimy paper. At the far end was a checkpoint manned by green-clad figures. My heart soared to see fellow guardsmen. Hey, am I glad to see you? I was starting to think I was the only one, I shouted out. They slowly turned to face me, and as the light of the stall's illuminated signs washed over their swollen and disfigured faces, I got a good look at them. Their skin was pallid and mottled, their eyes vacant and glazed with an otherworldly malevolence. In different places on their bodies, their bones had grown into spikes that jutted out from different places. Most notably, their hands where their finger bones protruded from each finger like claws. Their mouths opened, slack-jawed, and they shrieked as they sprinted towards me, their taloned hands outstretched. I gasped as I realized I had made a grave mistake. They were poxwalkers now. They were the enemy, and my voice had drawn their ravenous attention. I brought my las gun back up and fired, sending searing red beams of energy to light up the street. The first bolt lanced a poxwalker through the chest, causing it to convulse and collapse to the ground. A smoldering hole burnt right through it. My second struck a poxwalker squarely in the head, but it kept coming, a hole the size of my fist in its face. But my third shot sent it spiraling to the floor where it lay motionless and still. But there were more of them, and they charged with reckless abandon. My lasgun delivered the Emperor's mercy with each pull of the trigger. The beams pierced through diseased flesh that had already become putrefied and rotten. The last three reached me before I could shoot them. I sidestepped as the first lunged at me, its clawed hands raking the empty air, and fired at it until it fell backwards. Another grabbed a hold of my lasgun, so I drew my bayonet and stabbed it into its eye before shoving it back and hosing it down with lasfire. The last poxwalker stumbled over the body of one of its felled comrades, and I brought the butt of my lasgun back to slam into its extended jaw with a crack. The impact knocked it back, and I followed up with a point-blank shot to its head, and it abruptly dropped to the floor, like a puppet with its strings cut. After the grisly fight with the poxwalkers, I had a moment to catch my breath and take in my surroundings. The underhive's labyrinthine slums stretched out before me in a tangled web of shadowed alleys and decrepit tunnels, each more than likely harboring more of the infected. By not taking the direct route and trying to find my way through the unfamiliar hive, I was increasing the likelihood of meeting a gruesome end and, God Emperor forbid, joining the ranks of the infected. I looked for a solution to my situation and found it in the form of a rusted old transport vehicle. It was idling in a side road, its original occupant having met an unfortunate end at the hands of the poxwalkers. I looked over the controls, and it didn't appear much different from the field rotavators I had piloted back in the fields. With as much reverence as I could afford in my haste, I pulled the body from the front cabin and took its place in the driver's seat. After a few experimental twists of knobs, 
The engine rumbled to life. I was sure the noise would attract a lot of unwanted attention, so I quickly shifted it into drive and accelerated back the way I had come. The transport vehicle thundered down the underhive's claustrophobic streets, its engine roaring like an angry beast. I clung to the steering wheel with white-knuckled determination. I returned to the ghoulish congregation of poxwalkers that were still feasting on my fellow guardsmen. This time, with the engine roaring, there would be no hiding. They all looked up to see what the racket was, gore dribbling from their mouths. With a surge of adrenaline, I floored the accelerator and pointed the vehicle right at them, its old worn tires screeching against the rough terrain and bounced over the debris and bodies that littered the thoroughfare. Though it was hard going, the transport gained speed with each passing second. The pox walkers ran towards me, like I knew that they would, their putrid faces contorted in anticipation of fresh meat. With a deafening crash, I ploughed right into the heart of the oncoming horde. The impact flung bodies up into the air, like grotesque marionettes that trailed blood and viscera in their wake. The transport lurched violently as it crunched over their twisted forms. Then I erupted from the other side of the throng of infected and just kept going. The pox walkers pursued me, but despite their unholy determination, they couldn't keep up with the battered, carnage covered transport. I made good time and it wasn't long before I was within view of the command post. Like the rest of the hive I'd passed through, it was very different to the bustling scene I had left behind the previous day. The forward command post had been cobbled together from scavenged materials and reinforced with steel plating. The architecture was a haphazard amalgamation of makeshift barricades and fortified positions, but the hastily constructed fortress had been teeming with soldiers its palisades and mustering grounds filled with a sense of optimism that victory was within reach. But now, the place was transformed into a grim and dire setting. The once sturdy barricades and fortifications had been battered and torn aside. Huge, still-smoking areas were scarred by fire damage, and the crimson-stained battlements were a silent testament that the command post had fared only marginally better than the front. The lines and lines of disciplined soldiers were also absent. In their place were only two sentries that I could see. They stepped out of a tiny guard's hut and pointed their weapons at me as I brought the vehicle to a stop. They appeared weary and on edge. Their uniforms were disheveled and marked by signs of prolonged combat, and the look in their bloodshot eyes told me to take care. I didn't want to get shot by a twitchy sentry when I was so close to completing my mission, so I left my las gun behind and slowly got out of the transport. Halt! State your business! One of the sentries demanded, his voice tense, his weapon trained on me. I raised my hands and tried to look as unthreatening as possible. I'm Trooper Thorne. I was deployed yesterday. I've got a dispatch from the front. The sentry exchanged a brief, sceptical glance with his comrade. Don't be stupid. Ain't nobody left at the front. They're all dead. Everyone north of the slump is dead. I don't know what your game is, but best you get back on your way, son. It's true, I said. I think I'm the sole survivor. I have a vital dispatch from Sergeant Cale Drayton for Inquisitor Galen. Prove it, the second sentry insisted. I reached into my pocket, retrieving the note Sergeant Drayton had given me before he had passed, and held it up for them to see. When one of them reached out to take it, I snatched it away. It's for Inquisitor Galen's eyes only, I explained. You're either really brave or really stupid. Now hand it over. No, I can't! They seized both my arms and slammed me against the wall of the guard's hut. I tightened my grip as they started to pry my fingers open. It's for Inquisitor Galen only. It's for Inquisitor Galen, I pleaded. What is the meaning of this? A deep and resounding voice came from the shadows, and the sentries froze. Inquisitor Galen strode into the light, a half-eaten ration bar in one hand. His authoritative presence was undeniable as the sentries released me and gave a hasty imperial salute. He had sharp, intelligent eyes that seemed to miss nothing. His dark hair was neatly combed, and he had a well-groomed beard framing his mouth. He wore a long black and silver jacket, and a red sash with the symbol of the Inquisition emblazoned upon it in gold. He exuded an air of both scholar and warrior, and I couldn't help but feel both in awe and slightly unnerved by his presence. Well, you see, sir, one of the sentries began to explain. Inquisitor Galen held up a hand to silence him. Enough! I heard everything. Message. He clicked his fingers and held out a hand. I passed him the crumpled note which he unfolded and read. 
When he was done, he fixed his piercing gaze on me as he finished the ration bar. What's your name, guardsman? he asked. Thorn, sir. Have you read the contents of this message? No, sir, I would never. Sergeant Drayton insisted it was for your eyes only, I said as his scrutiny of me intensified. Very well, the Inquisitor said. Follow me. He led me to a small private office where I gave this report. Galen read what I wrote before putting it in one of the pockets of his long coat. He pressed a button on a terminal on the desk, and a young woman's voice answered. Inform Marshal Willem I'm returning to my ship. I will be in contact again, he said, before he stood and briskly walked past me and through the door. Just past the threshold, he stopped. Well, come along, guardsman. Sir, I asked. While there might not be much we can do for this hive, Galen explained, there is still much work to be done in the Emperor's service, and there could be a place for you, if you wish it. Without another word, he left. I hurried after him and into the service of the Emperor's Inquisition. Purge Protocol Declan was under no illusions. He was running for his life, him and the bishop both. Their footsteps echoed throughout the basilica's grim, body-strewn corridors. The air was thick with the acrid stench of blood, and the floors were treacherously slippery with the aftermath of carnage. His eyes darted between the lifeless bodies of the troopers and ecclesiarchy officials they passed, as he, half-pulled and half-dragged, the bishop along behind him. What the hell are those things? Declan panted between desperate breaths, his voice barely audible over the chaos and cries of not-so-distant battle. The bishop didn't answer. The thin, spindly old man had a confused look plastered all over his face that told Declan that he knew less about what was going on than he did. Metallic skull-faced monsters had appeared out of thin air to slaughter the living and horrifically wear their skin in macabre mockery. It seemed too fanciful, too extreme, like something in a scary holodrama for scaring youths. Yet Declan had seen them, seen them carve up most of his regiment of PDA, comrades he'd served with for years butchered in front of his very eyes. They had been trained to deal with the odd orc raid or workers' revolt. What could they do against enemies like this? How did they stand any chance of coming out of this alive? Declan pushed such thoughts of despair from his mind. Right now he had to focus on taking action, staying alive and protecting the bishop as he was ordered. Stay close, your eminence, he urged, his voice unintentionally revealing the strain of the situation. Fear not, my son. Keep the faith. The bishop, a frail yet resilient figure, replied reassuringly. Declan envied his faith. The fortress monastery had fallen in a matter of hours, and his own faith had crumbled along with the ineffectual defences the monsters had sundered in their attack. Where the throne can we go? Declan muttered to himself, panic gnawed at the pit of his stomach. The bishop either didn't hear him or had nothing to suggest, and remained silent. Other than the basic layout from the briefing, Declan didn't know the monastery well. There was a mustering point a few levels below them, and a command station a few levels below that. The command station offered the possibility of evacuation and would likely be the best place to take the bishop and receive new orders. Declan found an ornate archway set into an alcove that led to a spiral staircase of green-painted metal. Quickly, your eminence, this way, he said, and led the way down. The stairwell was dark, with only the occasional faltering lumen to light their way. In the poor visibility, the two men clung to the cold handrail and took extra care with their footing. The viscera and gore they had fled through had left their boots blood sodden, so their footfalls made sticky, squelching sounds with each precarious step. The bishop had some difficulty with the descent, and their progress slowed, but they continued on as best they could. They had made it about a dozen levels down when there was a loud metallic metal-on-metal metal clang above them, Declan chanced sticking his head out over the handrail and briefly looked up. Two pairs of malevolent green eyes stared down from the darkness high above. The menacing gaze of the lifeless eyes reignited his desperation for speed. He shouldered his las rifle and unceremoniously bundled the slight bishop onto his back and started to run down the steps. More than once he slipped, and it was a miracle that he somehow managed to stay upright on two feet. An archway to the side of the stairway opened up onto another level, and Declan took it. He had no idea what floor they were on. All that mattered was getting away from their inhuman pursuers. So he just ran, his leg muscles throbbing with the strain, 
and despite the searing demands of his burning lungs, Declan refused to stop or slow down. He ignored the protests of the old bishop behind him as he rounded a corner and loped down another corridor. Suddenly, a door set into the nondescript grey stone of the walls flung open. Declan was blindsided by an unseen force which seized both him and the bishop and dragged them into a room as the door swung shut. Declan and the bishop tumbled to the cold stone floor. Then a dozen hands seized Declan and held him down. He lashed out with his legs and flailed with his arms. Get off me, Zeno's filth, Declan shouted until a hand clamped down hard to cover his mouth. Quiet, fool, a hushed voice commanded. We're trying to survive here. We heard you running, and if you keep making noise, you put us all in danger. Understand? Declan nodded. The two men that held him slowly let him go, and he sat up. He was in a long rectangular room with pews and benches, haphazardly stacked against one wall. The only light came from a dozen candles at the far end, where a group of robed figures knelt huddled together on the floor. Declan sized up the two men that had pulled him into the side room. Like him, they wore the uniforms of the PDA. The one that had spoken to him had a sergeant's insignia emblazoned on one shoulder pad. He offered Declan a hand and pulled him to his feet. Those things are everywhere. We're hunkering down for now. With any luck, they'll miss us and we can relocate to somewhere safer. Got it? The sergeant said and held a finger to his lips. I understand, Declan quietly replied and helped the disheveled bishop to get up off the floor. Take him to the back with the rest of the faithful. Let him pray. But quietly. We could really do with a miracle about now. Yes, sergeant, Declan said and led the bishop to the back of the room where the robed ecclesiarchy priests quietly prayed. At the sight of the bishop, some of the priests exclaimed their thanks to the god-emperor on terror a little bit too fervently and loudly. They were quickly admonished with a harsh shh from the sergeant who shot them an angry glare. As he passed it, Declan noticed there was another door on the side wall obscured by shadows. What's through there? Declan asked the sergeant as quietly as he could manage. Dunno, it's locked but the bolt on this door is broken. We're going to use the pews to barricade it. If you want to make yourself useful, you can give us a hand. Yes, sir, Declan said and did as he was told. He was carrying a stack of chairs when the old bishop's hand reached out and pulled at his fatigues. My son, won't you join us in prayer? The old man asked, a fraction too loudly for the sergeant's liking. Declan looked over at the sergeant who waved him away. Whatever, just keep them quiet, he said. Declan set down the chairs he was holding and sat cross-legged on the floor beside the bishop. You're a good boy. I owe you my life. He on terror sees all things, including your kindness to this old man. He will watch over you as he watches over us all. The sergeant scoffed at the bishop's words, who pretended not to hear him. Keep the faith, my son. The emperor protects. He finished and offered Declan his hand. Declan took it and the priests held each other's hands and bowed their heads in silent prayer. At least their silence would please the sergeant, Declan thought, as he closed his own eyes and bowed his head along with them. The emperor protects. After everything he had seen, the loyal men and women butchered by the metallic monsters, he didn't know if he still believed that, but he wanted it to be true, and he silently prayed that would be enough. Declan's eyes shot open as he heard the haunting clank of metallic limbs on a hard stone floor from the corridor outside. Everyone froze. Slowly, the two other PDA troopers backed away from the door and, as quietly as they could, raised their las rifles. Abruptly, a sharp sickle of radiant green sliced through the barricaded door. The priests surged to their feet and backed away with screams and yells of alarm. Another glowing blade sliced clean through the door and the barricade of stacked pews beyond. Then, with a crash, one of the skull-faced monsters forced its way into the room. The two other PDA troopers opened fire to rain searing red beams down on it, forcing it back. But a second metallic monster scuttled through the breach the first one had made. It moved with alarming speed on three crescent-shaped legs. In the blink of an eye, it was upon the sergeant and struck down with one of the oversized green blades that had been grafted onto its arm. The energy weapon sliced him in half, head to groin, and the two halves of the man toppled to the floor on either side, with a soggy thump. Declan realized he was still holding the bishop's hand. He released it, brought up his own las rifle, and opened fire. The grey metal exterior of the first monster 
pockmarked by Laz fire, began to shimmer and slide like it was made of mercury. Liquid metal welled up into the holes that had been burned into it before setting hard again. It solidified so seamlessly that it was as if it had never taken any damage at all. It charged at the other trooper, shrugging off his Laz fire as someone might ignore a winter hailstorm. Its green, glowing weapon plunged into the hapless trooper's midsection before hoisting him up into the air. Blood sprayed from his lips in a violent coughing spasm, then he slumped forward on the blade. Dead. With a powerful swipe, the trooper was tossed off of the blade to crumple onto the floor as callously as someone might toss away a piece of garbage. The wailing and fearful shouts of the priests were so loud that Declan didn't hear the beep that indicated that the power pack of his Laz rifle was empty. But when he pulled the trigger and nothing happened, he understood the situation. As had been drilled into him, he pulled out the bayonet that was strapped to his leg and fixed it to the front of his rifle. He positioned himself between the two Zeno's abominations and the priests and made ready with his would-be spear. The metallic monsters plodded leisurely towards him, each clang of their crescent legs rousing a renewed chorus of terror filled yells from behind him. As the monsters closed in, Declan's mind raced. What unspeakable force had birthed these mechanical horrors? Was there anything that humanity could do in the face of such hopelessness? His mouth felt dry and his legs weakened. He would do his duty and he would die, that Declan knew, but he held his ground regardless, his grip tightening on his weapon. Standing here, between cosmic evil and the defenceless clergy, would it be a good death? Was there such a thing? At the very least, in some grand design, he hoped the Emperor looked down on him and found his bravery adequate in the face of his ineffectual attempts to stop the invaders. One of the monsters rose up before him and Declan stabbed at it with all his strength and fury, but it had little effect. As the metal blade of his bayonet hit the metallic body of the Xenos monster, it broke and clattered to the floor. As Declan looked up at the Xenos, he thought he could see contempt in the hostile green glow of its eyes. It raised up one of the large blades it had for an arm, and Declan closed his eyes. This was it. Death was upon him. He hoped the killing blow would be quick and that his suffering would be short. But the killing blow never came. Instead, the locked door exploded inward in a shower of wooden chunks and splinters. Through the newly shattered breach emerged a towering figure in blue ceramite. The giant raised a bolter and opened fire. Each shot was a thunderous proclamation of righteous judgment against the Xenos that loomed over Declan. Under the powerful barrage it staggered, its three legs buckled, and it fell. Their ceramite-clad saviour then turned his attention to the other Xenos that rushed towards him. In a fluid movement, he drew a power sword from his waist and engaged it in melee. Declan could hardly believe his eyes. Could it be? Had their prayers been answered? Was this not one of the Emperor's angels in the flesh? The Astartes moved with unmatched skill, blocking and parrying with swift precision. His strikes, delivered with ferocious speed and unbridled fury, were an awe-inspiring display of martial prowess. Declan was jolted from his reverie with a surge of adrenaline as the Xenos before him started to move. Shakily it rose to its feet and turned to face the Astartes. Slowly it circled around, and Declan realized it was trying to flank him from behind. As before, the alloy of its body seemed to liquefy and pool into the large craters and blast holes the bolter rounds had rendered into its back. Suddenly, Declan remembered his single standard issue grenade. As he ran, he unclipped it from his belt, took out the pin and pressed it into one of the craters the liquid metal was flowing into. The grenade was enveloped and disappeared into the metallic fluid as the Xenos span around to face him. But before it could attack, the grenade exploded with such force that Declan was blasted off his feet and thrown through the air to crash into a wall, knocking him unconscious. Trooper, can you stand? A deep voice called out, breaking through the blackness that enveloped Declan's consciousness. It was a voice of obvious authority, perhaps an officer or someone important. Declan wasn't sure. But being a good soldier, he obeyed. With a great effort, he forced his eyes to open. Kneeling down before him was the blue armored Astartes. Of the Xenos monsters, there was no sign. What happened? Declan asked. Thanks to your quick thinking, the Xenos have been dispatched. Can you stand? The Astartes offered a hand, and groggily Declan took it and struggled to his feet. 
I thought I was dead. As did I. But it seems the Emperor still has work for you to do. The Astartes pointed to the door it had smashed its way through. This way leads to safety. I entrust the other survivors to your care. Take them, and may the Emperor watch over you. Declan nodded. But what of you? he asked. The Astartes paused, his ceramite-clad form radiating the solemn resolve of one of the Emperor's own angels of death. I am his wrath, the Astartes said as he reloaded his bolter, and there are Xenos to purge. Enmity's Edge by Elliot Hamer The Land Raider convoy reached a halt, fresh snow falling from their hulls as they came to rest. Their forest green livery would ordinarily be a heartening sight to the Astra Militarum forces gathered before them, but the harsh brutality of war on the ice world of Rimanok meant that there was little jubilation at their arrival. Motors stood idle as the assault ramp of the lead vehicle lowered, its interior light illuminating the late gloom, and outstrode Lazarus and his fellow angels of death. The Imperial Guardsmen were despondent, the whites of their eyes showing a regiment close to breaking point. They were taking what little cover they could find in bombed-out ruins, huddled around flame burners in a pitiful effort to escape the biting cold and indiscriminate psi bombardments. Colonel Barkus, Rimanok, 31st Ice Warriors, the Astra Militarum officer gave a shaky salute. The prism stands. We've gone through 80% of our artillery stockpile, and even had two marauder runs on it. Each time it swallowed our warheads whole. Ate them up and carried on flickering. We're just about out of ideas, sir, and these emperor-damned cybombardments have us at our wit's end. Lazarus turned his sights to the prism. Across the plateau, an immaterial prismatic spectrum stood in the center of the enemy's line. The size of a warlord titan, endless strands of color flowed from pinnacle to base, its patterns both seamless and sickening all at once. At its tip, a small but similarly colored sphere was rolling in suspension. Even as Lazarus evaluated it, its rotations grew faster and faster, the shimmering colors a haze of confusion to his mind. There was a commotion on the parapet as the ice warriors ran for cover. Eyes down, the sphere cast off, cannonading itself through the air at high velocity and making impact fifty meters from Lazarus's position. A kaleidoscopic detonation erupted, firing off retina-searing waves of warp energy in all directions. Those in the blast zone fell to the floor in agony, whilst those who did not avert their gaze or have their vision shielded behind a helmet of power armor were similarly afflicted. Guardsmen curled up on the ground, their heads swelling to bursting point as their senses were overloaded. Frenzied eyes became bulbous with stimulation until a wet pop showered the ground with their contents. Viscous fluid leaked from their ears, noses, and now empty eye sockets. An effluence of blood and brains that was accompanied by the harrowing screams of the dying. Commissars drew their bolt pistols, not for the first time that day, and walked the parapet delivering the Emperor's peace. Librarian Ethuriel's brow was heavy with concern. What is it, brother? Lazarus asked, turning to him. This is unlike anything I've witnessed before, the librarian responded. The prism must fall, but if it's impervious to arms fire, the librarian trailed off in thought. Lazarus gave him time. In his experience, the right strategy wasn't one found on impulse. Its appearance is too sudden to be the consequence of a ritual or warp incursion, Ethuriel continued. I would have sensed it earlier if so. It must have a more localized cause, an artifact perhaps, or a powerful psyker. Lazarus's mind worked over an amassment of details and possibilities. As he processed his plan, the prism continued to flicker. Another sphere had manifested at the pinnacle, smaller than the last, but slowly growing with each variegated rotation. If it's an artifact, can you contain it? he asked Ethuriel. Yes, it is powerful, so I might not be able to shut it down completely, but I can smother its effects long enough for the rest of the librarius to lend aid. Good, Lazarus replied, because if it's a psyker, I can kill it. Lazarus opened a channel-wide vox. All forces, this is Master Lazarus. Prepare to commence spearhead assault. I want every available gun covering our advance. An evil has rooted itself in Rimanok, and we will cut it out. At the tip of the spear, ardent advance, Lazarus's Land Raider Crusader carved a path across the frozen plateau, snowdrifts and boulders smashed aside by its implacable offense. 
A staccato of projectile impact sounded across its hull as the small arms fire of the enemy bounced off its armoured plating. Hundreds of rounds were shot back in return as the vehicle's hurricane bolters and assault cannons tore mutants, beastmen and cultists asunder. To its rear, predator squadrons, devastator squads and battle tanks of the Rimanok 19th Heavy Armour bombarded the enemy. Massed packs of demon engines spat back blasts of ectoplasma and let off salvos with their Hades autocannons that seared and rent the transports of the advancing Dark Angels. The survivors pulled themselves clear of the wreckage only to be brought low by the hateful volleys of the heretics. The blood of martyrs is the seed of the Imperium. Lazarus thought to himself. Thirty seconds out, his command squad drew their weapons and Ethereal focused his mind for the psychic battle ahead. They knew not the outcome of a close assault on the prism, but doubt was not their way. They would follow Lazarus into the great rift itself without a word uttered and cast it back with bolt, blade and indignation. Twenty seconds. A large projectile scored a penetrating hit. The hurricane bolter's sponsum was torn off and one half of its magazine ignited. Four warriors went down in the explosion. Ten seconds. Another hit jolted them forward, a las cannon blast that seared a hole through the drive bay. The driver was a bloody mess, but he clinged to life to fulfill his duty. He hit the mechanism to deploy the crusader's assault ramp and aimed straight for the prism. Disembark. Lazarus ran down the ramp and into the heart of madness. Stepping through the prismatic barrier, his charge was stalled by an ominous weight upon his psyche. His senses began to desert him. The stimuli was there, yet his mind could not process it. Every step was an exertion, every breath a labor of effort. He was aware, yet felt powerless to compel his body to react. Lazarus surveyed his surroundings. At the center of the prism stood a sorcerer of the Thousand Suns, his arms raised and waves of color flowing through his form. Ithuriel had been right. I am a vessel of the Emperor's vengeance, spat Lazarus, forcing his way forward through the relentless waves of psychic force, but every step became harder than the last. The synapses in his brain were shutting down, his body refusing to respond to mental commands. All about him, those that had survived the armored rush were similarly afflicted. Many had fallen, their forms deathly still on the icy floor. Brother Ithuriel was on one knee, showing the strain of a mind waging war on a different plane. Lazarus raised his bolt pistol. I am his wrath made manifest. He unloaded his magazine at his enemy, the strain of the act pulling most of his shots wide. Any that found their mark bounced harmlessly off ceramite armor. What was once second nature was now an exercise in futility. The sorcerer glanced over at Lazarus, a contemptuous gaze and disdainful scoff his only reply, before his vision returned to the prism and his ritual continued. Lazarus dropped to one knee, his life force breaking down under the psychic onslaught. He screamed at his mind and body to respond with the one last kernel of resistance within him that would not give in. Mere meters away, Ithuriel was fatally succumbing to a greater psyche. Lazarus felt his brother reach into his mind and infuse his last vestiges of strength into him. The defiance that powered Lazarus was stoked, an ember of fury that would not be extinguished, and a blaze of righteous repugnance was set. As Ithuriel's duty came to an end, Lazarus was rejuvenated. Through my deeds his will be done, Lazarus vowed as he rose up to his feet, lifting his sword above his head in an indomitable redoubt against the psychic torrent. All that he had left was summoned as he hurled the blade through the air. It flew its energized edge alight with Lazarus's loathing and found its mark. Lazarus's sword cut through Ceramite and buried itself to the hilt in his enemy's chest. The sorcerer fell to his knees in shock, the prism contracting as his arms fell to his sides. His head lolled onto his breastplate as hot blood fell to the frozen ground, and tendrils of steam curled upwards around his fallen form. The prism exploded, throwing polychromatic discharge across the battlefield that reflected off the white of the ice. Hundreds of warriors fell in agony. Lazarus was thrown back by the blast and his world went black. Gone Dark by Dirk Vayner The lumen under the barrel of Gerican Orzan's lasgun pierced the utter darkness of the corridor before him. 
Drifting particles of dust danced lazily through the cold light as the sergeant signaled his squad to follow him into the bland octagonal hallway leading into the innards of the Advent Imperatus. The ship was completely dark. Not even emergency lumens lit any of the halls and chambers they had passed so far. The boots of the five highly trained soldiers rang on the steel-plated floors. Other than that, everything remained eerily quiet. This is like a ghost ship, Guardsman Mika voxed to the rest of the squad. Did you see the hull on our way in? Not a single scratch on her. No battle damage. Nothing. I know, Zararel agreed. And how did a single frigate become stranded so far out here? What happened to the rest of the fleet? I know what will happen to you if you don't start maintaining Vox discipline soon, Sergeant Gerrican barked. The five guardsmen went on in silence, deeper into the vessel and further away from the safety of their dropship back in the hangar bay. It is strange, though, Gerrican thought to himself. The lonely Tempest-class ship had just appeared, drifting through the stars, dark and inert. Imperial authorities had tried hailing the frigate, but to no avail. Eventually, Gerrican's squad had been dispatched to investigate where the Advent Imperatus had so suddenly come from. They hadn't met any resistance when their craft entered the hangar bay. Upon arrival, they had found that the ship's generatoria still idled, powering the emergency protocols that maintained the flow of recycled air and a stable gravity field. But that was about it. So far, they hadn't found any sign of the crew. After a short while, they reached a junction. One passage led towards the bridge, while the other went deeper into the guts of the frigate, where the crew compartments and Medicaid stations would be. Zararel, Isren, you check the lower decks, Gerrican ordered. Mika, Holt, you're with me. We'll see if there's someone on the bridge. Keep your weapon spirits watchful. Come on, Is, Zararel said, shouldering his plasma gun as he marched into the left corridor. As Isren followed, Gerrican caught himself looking after her longer than he intended. His younger sister had joined the 105th Falkenberg Wardrakes not too long ago, and the pride he felt was still fresh. She had doggedly fought her way through the harsh recruitment tithing and the brutal training of the regiment in the very next intake after Gerrican himself, determined that she should join the same tithe uptake, and thus the same regiment as him. Isrin hadn't done this out of some misplaced need for his company or protection. Rather, she had always been determined not to let Gerrican outpace her in anything. Sure enough, she was an exceptional soldier, but the sergeant could not simply brush aside the fact that he was her superior now. He couldn't treat her differently than any other of his warriors. You coming, Sarge? Mika asked. Does the Emperor sit on a golden throne? Gerrican replied. Move to the bridge. The bridge of the Advent Imperatus seemed as dark and lifeless as the rest of the ship. Emperor's eye, I don't understand this. Gerrican muttered. Let's spread out, Vigilantus Patton. Mika, you take the right flank, Holt, your left. The two other guardsmen acknowledged his command with short vox clicks and lifted their las guns. Mika prowled off to the far right side of the bridge. His lumen danced over dark screens and servitor stations. Do you see that? He voxed. Slumped servitors hung in their mountings, still connected to tactical data shrines and cogitator stations. They looked malnourished and dead, but there was no obvious cause. Hold position, Mika, Gerrican voxed. Holt, investigate the other flank. As soon as his voice ceased, Holt was off to the left. Her lumen swiveled through the darkness as she made for the next vantage point. The light suddenly jerked upwards as she fell. Holt, come in, Gerrican called. I'm all right, she answered, breathing heavily. I, I tripped over someone. He's dead, like the servitors. Gerrican advanced to Holt's position, heart thudding against his ribs, what in the Emperor's name is going on here? He looks as if he just lay down and never got up, Holt commented as he arrived. She was right. The man just lay there, collapsed like a forgotten rag doll. Gerrican nodded and snuck forward silently to check the rest of the bridge. He kept a keen eye on his surroundings, but there weren't any life signs, just more dead crew members. The corpses all looked gaunt and haggard, as if they had simply fallen into a coma or starved to death sunken over their stations. No life signs, he voxed, as he reached the command throne in the center of the bridge. He frowned as he looked upon the ship's deceased commander. The shipmaster's eyes were wide open, glassy, staring at the ceiling. Gerrican shuddered. At ease, Wardrakes, 
There's no one here but the dead. May the Emperor protect their souls. There must be a reason for all this, sir, Holt replied. People don't simply fall over and die. Gerakan nodded. I agree. Mika, awaken the data extractor and hook it up. Let us see if we can get some of the cogitator banks up and running. Maybe they can spit out anything about what has happened here. In the meantime, let's hope that Sararel and Isren have more luck. The plated doorway before Isren opened with a soft hiss as she punched the activation rune. All right, she muttered. We should find the Medicaid station down there. And maybe some answers, she thought. Zararel nodded. Quick sweep of the outer chambers, then advance to the crew compartments. The sooner we're done here, the better. I don't like this place at all. Isrin nodded. You'll take point, she decided. I'd prefer to have your plasma gun between me and whatever we find down there. Zararel shrugged and lifted his weapon, thumbing its activation rune. The plasma coil illuminated their surroundings in soft blue light and hummed gently. The squad's weapons specialist took a step towards the doorway. Zararel Kreslin of the 105th Falkenberg Wardrake speaking, he shouted into the darkness, his voice augmented by his helmet's internal vox gear. Can anyone hear me? The silence only seemed to become louder. Isrin could almost feel it breezing over her from the darkness like a chilly wind. Zararel looked back at her. The red shimmer of his bionic eye implant mixed with the blue glow of his plasma weapon. Let's go, he said, and advanced into the next chamber. Isran followed him and let her lumen wander over the hall that opened behind the doorway. I think we found the crew, Zararel breathed as he took in the scene before them. Isran's skin crawled as the light of her lumen travelled through the Medicaid station, brushing over row after row of dormant figures on gurneys. They were hooked to blinking life support shrines. Several gurneys had toppled over. People were strapped to some of them, alive but completely inert. Others had rolled from their sick beds, ripping out the life support wires in process. They seemed to have starved where they lay. Strewn between them were the Medicae themselves, as gaunt and malnourished as their patients. A thin film of spilled nutritional liquid covered the floor and dripped from life support systems, only half hooked to people who wouldn't need them anymore. It looks as if something made them just drop into a sort of coma, one after another, Isran whispered. They must have known, Zararel said nodding towards a dead Medicae adept on the floor. They tried to save as many as they could, before it took them as well. Anyone not hooked into life support just starved. But why? Isran wondered, still trying to process the macabre scene in front of her. What happened? Only the Emperor knows, Zararel replied. Isran noticed that his grip around the plasma gun had tightened. Better let the sergeant know what we found. Isran nodded and opened a Vox connection. Isran to Gerakan. A short click indicated that her brother was listening. We found an improvised Medicaid station on the crew decks, she continued. Multiple dead. Other crew hooked into life support, but they're dormant. Everyone who's not connected to life support is dead. Shh, suggest shh, shh, wake, shh. Gerakan's voice came in chopped. Isran tapped on the vox bead of her helmet. Gerakan, sergeant. Shh, repeat, shh, wake, shh. Blasted thing, she cursed. Something's blocking the Vox signal down here, Sararel. Sararel nodded. Think we should try waking one of them up for questioning? I suppose, Isran answered, and approached the closest gurney. She carefully avoided stepping onto a rotting Medicai servitor next to it and eyed the blinking control station of the life support system the man was hooked into. Medulla pattern type 4, she muttered. Isran punched a series of Imperial Standard Codes into the control panel and intoned the few catch-all prayers she knew for rousing machine spirits. This should bring him back to the Emperor's service. A soft hum came from the life support system as it pumped drugs into the dormant patient. Isran took a step back, lifted her las gun and aimed it at the comatose man. A side glance told her that Sararel had his weapon aimed at him as well. A few moments passed, but the man just lay there as unmoving and inert as the ship itself. Isran took a deep breath and closed in on him, almost reluctantly. Ever so slowly, she bowed down. Eventually, she could hear his breath coming in a slow, flat rhythm. His chest barely moved, but he was definitely alive. He just didn't seem to actually be in there. Isran was about to say something, but the words caught in her throat as Sararel groaned behind her. 
She whirled around, instincts kicking in instantly as she aimed her las gun. Cruel silver claws protruded from her comrade's stomach. Before Isrin could react any further, Zararel was violently lifted and hurled across the room, crashing into a row of gurneys. That was not the reason why she started screaming. Isrin squeezed the trigger of her las gun, aiming it towards Zararel's killer as it sprung into sudden motion and rushed towards her. Isrin, Isrin, I repeat, don't try to wake up anyone down there, Gerakan shouted into his vox, although he knew that the connection had been interrupted. Emperor's eye, he cursed, looking back onto the unsteadily flickering monitor of the cogitator systems. He felt a thick knot tightening in his throat. Pack everything together, Mika. We have all the information that we need. Let's rendezvous with Isrin and Sararel, then we'll evacuate. Mika nodded and started furling up the data extractor's cables with practiced movements. Gerakan was glad he did not have to look at the images they had extracted from the cogitator banks any longer. The Imperial authorities had to know as soon as possible. Extractor is appeased and quiescent, Sarge, Mika said eventually. Acknowledged. Move out, Wardrakes. Let's get our comrades. Holt hesitated. Wait a second, she said. The Orspex is picking something up. She hadn't even finished her sentence when Gerakan felt a sudden tingling sensation in his stomach, as if he was dropping into a deep abyss. The air around them sizzled. Move! Now! The sergeant shouted, breaking into a run. Three blinding green flashes of energy burst in mid-air and nightmarish creatures stepped from them. They were humanoid in shape, but their bodies were cast from a brass-coloured metal alloy. As Gerakan looked in horror, one of the things turned towards him, its single eye glowing unsympathetically as it raised a ghostly glowing gun and fired. Gerakan skidded beneath the burst of deathly energy and cursed as sparks from a damaged console behind him rained down on him. Holt had no such luck. One of the metal creatures shot her in the head and she collapsed, dead before she hit the ground. Mika managed to loose a salvo of lasfire into the back of Holt's killer. A row of molten craters appeared on the stooped thing's carapace, but the metal started moving and flowed back together. Only seconds later, it seemed as if Mika had never fired any shots at the creature. The thing turned towards the guardsman impossibly fast, methodically returning fire. It unerringly hit Mika's head. He silently fell against a navigation console and lay still. Gerakan cursed and drew his power sword. The three metal figures ignored him for the moment and stalked towards Mika's body. They want the data extractor, Gerakan realized. He had to act fast. For the Emperor, he shouted, and ran towards the nearest creature. The metal warriors turned to face him, and two shots cooked the air over his head as he let himself fall. His momentum carried him onwards, and his power sword sliced through the shins of one of the metal monstrosities. As the thing collapsed, Gerakan rushed towards Mika and grabbed the data extractor. Then he was at the bridge door, diving headlong through its frame as more energy beams punched into the surrounding walls. Gerakan responded in kind, tossing a frag grenade behind him. That ought to keep those blasted things occupied, he muttered to himself. As he rushed down the dark corridor, his thoughts wandered to his sister. He wanted to go get her, wanted to escape with her, but he knew his duty. He clutched the data extractor tighter. Duty always came first. He couldn't treat her differently. He had to reach the dropship, had to get out of this ship and report what he had seen. The light from his lumen jumped through the black corridor unsteadily. Gerakan panted heavily as he pressed onwards. His heart hammered in his chest, and he expected his life to be snuffed out by a shot to the back of his head any second. But the shot never came, and he eventually reached the Advent Imperatus's hangar bay. Get the engines running, Gerakan voxed as he ran towards the waiting craft. The hatch of the dropship's crew compartment opened, and a hunched silhouette stepped outside, unrecognizable in the darkness of the hangar. What are you doing? Get the engines running, Gerakan repeated, hurrying closer. Gerakan, I'm so glad you made it, his sister answered. Gerakan stopped in his tracks, and his heart seemed to skip a beat. Isrin, he whispered. She made it after all. She actually survived. They would escape this nightmare together. Yes, brother, the figure said, and came closer. As it stepped into the light of Gerakan's lumen, the sergeant felt his strength sapping out of his body, and he sank to his knees. No, Isra, no. The skin of his sister was draped around the metal frame of the thing that prowled towards him. 
Beneath the empty holes where her blue eyes once sat, callous green lenses watched him, observing his every reaction with cold intent. With each step, blood dripped from the nightmarish apparition. Brother? The monster repeated, modulating the voice of his sister to perfection. Gerican closed his eyes and welcomed its embrace. Gears of Time Gladius Primus of the Adeptus Mechanicus, a devout servant of the Omnissiah, stood among the dunes and regarded the alien ruins. The planet's original name was lost to the obscurity of time, but to Imperial records it was known as Omicron Gamma 4b. The devastated world bore the scars of an eon's past war. Who the combatants were and what cataclysmic event consigned their race to the burial ground of time was unknown. But the remnants of their shattered civilization were buried beneath the treacherous sands, with their secrets waiting to be discovered. Primus scanned the landscape with an air of solemn reverence. By his side stood his fellow tech priests, Gladius Secundus and Gladius Tertius, their augments glinting under the large orange sun as their red-robed silhouettes blended into the arid scenery of the alien desert. They had found the intact alien structure during their routine archaeological expedition, Concealed for millennia beneath a granular shroud of sand, it had finally revealed itself after the latest of the colossal sandstorms that regularly scoured the planet's surface. It was a huge edifice, an enigma wrought in materials foreign to the tech priest's experience. The wind-worn exterior bore the scars of countless storms. As Primus approached the unearthed structure, a resonance hummed through the air, the echoes of technology long dormant stirring to life. The three tech priests exchanged glances, their augmented eyes narrowing with a shared eagerness. The promise of what they might discover both thrilled and unsettled the servants of the machine god. They found an exposed entrance. It was a massive doorway adorned with alien glyphs that seemed to shimmer with an inner light. With a solemn nod, Gladius Primus raised his augmented hand, fingers adorned with sacred bionics, and gestured towards the huge door. He could feel the transmissions emanating from the structure on a number of wavelengths that would have been imperceptible to those not blessed with the augmentations of the cult Mechanicus. The structure obviously belonged to a people that understood the power and importance of the blessed machine. On the higher end of the electromagnetic spectrum, he reached out and responded. As man and structure made contact in the ether, the bronzed alien metal of the construct responded. The etched, intricate patterns flashed, and the doorway ground open with an otherworldly resonance. The difference in pressure inside the structure caused the surrounding air to be greedily sucked in, as if the abandoned structure had been holding its breath, waiting for Primus's arrival. The opened entrance revealed a long, dark corridor beyond. With the allure of hidden knowledge, Primus made his way into the darkness, Secundus and Tertius at his side. The interior was made from an onyx black stone, and adorned with strange symbols and sigils. The alien hieroglyphs seemed to move out of the corner of their eyes, shifting and morphing, but became static and still when looked at directly. Smaller corridors branched off from the main passage, leading to small circular chambers where unfamiliar relics were displayed on dust-covered plinths of polished black stone. They documented and ran cursory scans on the unusual artifacts. Though unquestionably advanced, their purpose and composition seemed undiscernible. Proposition. This civilization had achieved a level of technological prowess beyond our understanding. Secundus emitted in the binary language of the machine cult, before Primus cut her off with a deep horn-like hoot. Consider your words with care, lest you profane the Omnissiah. We are here to investigate and document, not to deliver commentary. Perform your function. Primus rebuked her. Secundus chimed her acceptance and they went about their work. As they continued, Primus felt the whispers on the electromagnetic wind, a symphony of knowledge and madness as it brushed across the edges of his consciousness. They came in rhythmic pulses, again and again. Primus let them in and allowed a brief communion between man and the eldritch machine in order to triangulate their origin. They were coming from the central chamber, and he allowed the transmissions to draw him to their source. They reached a crescendo when they eventually entered the hall at the end of the long central walkway. The unfamiliar pulses of foreign code became so powerful that Primus had no choice but to block them out. The hall was a vast expanse of what looked like black marble in the shape of a pyramid fifty yards across. 
The walls converged in a point at their zenith and were decorated with great murals that depicted scenes of galactic majesty and cosmic horror. Frustratingly, Primus's efforts to accurately record them were thwarted. Whenever he focused on them for too long, his ocular implants became overwhelmed with static, forcing him to look away. In the center was a triangular plinth, on top of which was a green crystalline artifact which palpitated with an eerie green light, like the steady rhythm of a heartbeat. The tech priest's metallic footsteps echoed through the hall when they advanced to get a better look. The closer they approached, the faster the pulsing became, as if the heart of the alien structure raced in anticipation of their approach. The artifact itself appeared solid, but would morph and change shape with each pulse of light, from an irregular polyhedron to a cube, then an octahedron, and back again. Deep inside, barely visible even by Primus's augmented eyes, mesmerizing patterns of light coiled and danced in illuminated displays of the blessed geometry of the Omnissiah. The air around the artifact shimmered, as if reality itself was bending and twisting to contain it as it floated just above the triangular pedestal. Set into each side of the pedestal were two silver discs with molded imprints of stubby three-fingered hands. The tech priests stood in silent awe before the unknown device. Secundus, her augmentations whirring softly, observed the silver discs. Inquiry. Is it a key, a cipher to unlock the secrets contained within? The very air resonates with the song of the captured machine spirit. It calls to us on the electromagnetic waves to set it free. The Omnissiah's mysteries will be laid bare before us. Primus spoke, his voice a steady synthesized tone that betrayed no emotion. It is a thing of the Xenos and alien cognition. It is an abomination. But perhaps it holds a flicker of the Omnissiah's beneficence that we were meant to find. We stand at the precipice of forbidden knowledge. Should we grasp it, or should we strike it down? Tertius considered his words carefully. His biomechanical parts clicked and beeped as he deliberated internally. The resonance of the alien technology could unlock lost knowledge. Yet we tread on the precipice of heresy. The machine god's will guides us, but the path is shrouded. The chamber held a pregnant silence as the tech priests weighed the implications. The artifact's pulsations seemed to echo the heartbeat of the very cosmos, leaving the tech priest standing at the crossroads of either discovery or damnation. Having reached a decision, Primus stepped forward and expectantly thrust his hands onto two of the silver discs. But nothing happened. Primus pulled his hands away. Hypothesis, Secundus said. Perhaps the three stations are to be used concurrently. Primus beeped his acceptance to the theory and Secundus and Tertius took up positions on each of the remaining two sides of the triangular plinth. With a synchronized movement, they all placed their hands on the silver discs in front of them. At their touch, the discs lit up as ethereal plumes of radiant light appeared and disappeared all around them. Energy coursing through and up the tech priest's bionic appendages as the crystalline artifact hummed with newfound vitality at their collective touch. The green light of the artifact intensified and it formed a perfect sphere and expanded until it was three times the size of a man. The mesmerizing patterns within the ballooned crystal swirled faster, a kaleidoscope of otherworldly hues and random images. Abruptly, the triangular plinth emitted a harmonic resonance so loud the floor shook as it reverberated throughout the hall. Then, the shifting patterns consolidated into a vision of an ancient battlefield, a panorama of war-torn devastation. As they watched, Astartes turned on Astartes. Bolters roared, chainswords whirred, and the air itself crackled with psychic energy. The very ground quaked beneath the weight of titanic war engines, their metallic roars drowned by the screams of dying soldiers. What are we witnessing? Primus asked. These are Imperial forces, Tertius said. Supposition. Judging by the classification of armored vehicles, this is a recording of the Horus heresy. The ability to manufacture those patterns is no longer available, Secundus suggested. Primus scanned his memory banks to identify the heraldry of the Astartes involved and potentially triangulate the most likely planet. Affirmative. Fascinating. Indications are, this is a representation of events on Istvan V. But why is it showing us thus? Unclear, Tertius chimed. Endeavor to assert control. Commune with the machine spirit and guide it towards the end of this time period, Primus instructed. 
The pulsing heartbeat of the artifact quickened as the scenes unraveled and coalesced into a vision of the Bridge of the Vengeful Spirit and the final clash between the Emperor and Horus. With a bright flash, the images abruptly disappeared and the crystal sphere contracted into its original state of shifting shapes. The three tech priests stood in silence for a moment. The air in the chamber seemed to crackle with residual energy. The green glow of the artifact dimmed and returned to the stable pulsing it had when they had first entered. Primus pulled his hands away and broke the silence. Truly fascinating. But why would a Xenos race record this? He asked. Supposition. It is unlikely they did. Secundus voiced. These visions are not a recording. The capability to film all locations and the capacity to store the resulting data is insufficient. Hypothesis. The viewing aperture generates a temporal distortion that allows optical reconnaissance across space and time. Intriguing thought process, Primus said. These visualizations could transcend mere historical records. How best to test that hypothesis? If it is a temporal lens, we could attempt to see forward as well as back, Tertius suggested. Primus' augmented eyes narrowed in thoughtful reflection. Let us begin the experiment. Attempt to channel the machine spirit to reveal that which has not yet been, Primus said. The three tech priests once again synchronized their movements and communed with the Xenos device, placing their hands upon the silver discs. The air rippled with energy once more as the orb expanded. The visions projected onto its surface writhed as the vision was propelled forward into the unknowable future. The first scene materialized before them, a haunting vision of destruction. The mighty fortress world of Cadia was brought low, shattered under the devastating weight of a star of black stone as it crashed into the surface. The very fabric of reality seemed to warp and tear, signaling the cataclysmic birth of the great rift that cleaved the galaxy in twain. In the wake of this cosmic upheaval, a figure clad in blue and gold power armor emerged. Lord Commander Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, stood resolute amidst the chaos. His return heralded a glimmer of hope for the Imperium, a beacon in the darkness that threatened to consume all of humanity. Primus, his mechanical eyes recording every frame of the unfolding events, felt a twinge of uncertainty. With such uncertain times ahead, the tech priest pondered how he would fare in the decades ahead. Reacting to his thoughts, the depiction on the artifact he could see changed to a view of the very hall in which they now stood. He saw Secundus, Tertius, and himself at the pedestal. Without warning, Secundus and Tertius, his fellow tech priests and companions of many years, drew weapons and attacked him. Primus felt a surge of confusion. What did this mean? Why would the artifact show him such a thing? The three tech priests had long worked together and he had never had reason to doubt their loyalty before. Why would they undertake such action? Primus cogitated. The ability to accurately know the future was a powerful capability. The applications were limitless, as were the opportunities afforded to whoever possessed such access. Perhaps the very position of Fabricator General was not beyond reach. With such a temptation could they turn on him to keep it for themselves. If this were indeed a vision of the future, there was no could about it. That was precisely the course of action his traitorous fellow tech priests were going to take. The three tech priests looked at one another, their augmented faces obscuring the sudden nervousness with which they regarded one another. Logic dictated that Primus's best course of action was to attack first while the element of surprise was still his. Primus pulled back from the altar, drew his Volkite pistol and fired. The searing energy from Primus's pistol lanced through the air, targeting Secundus with deadly precision. Her cybernetic enhancements gave her faster-than-human reactions and allowed her to evade the energy beam just in time. A two-foot-long blade shot from her arm, which crackled with a hazy field of blue energy. She leapt towards Primus, seeking to thrust the power weapon into him. Tertius raised his own las pistol and fired hot bolts of energy towards them both. They were deflected harmlessly by Primus's personal energy shield, but one struck Secundus in the back and she staggered. There was a mighty crack as Primus discharged his Volkite again. The blast hit Tertius with such force that he was thrown back his flesh melting and his mechanical implants reduced to slag. Secundus brought herself around and slashed out with her bladed arm and severed Primus's gun arm at the elbow. 
Disarmed but not defenseless, Primus unleashed his mechadendrites. The whirring appendages shot out from his back and moved with a grace that belied their deadly intent as they stabbed deep into Secundus, rending through both meat and machine alike. In her final moments, Secundus drove her power weapon into Primus. With a brutal and deliberate motion, she tore the blade across his midsection, nearly cleaving him in two. Locked in a murderous embrace, the two tech priests met their ends at each other's hands, and the hall once again fell silent, as it had been for eons before the intruders arrived. Above ground, another sandstorm raged. The structure was recovered by a veil of sand, concealing the fate of the missing tech priests from any that would come searching for them. In the hall, the artifact hummed with a malicious satisfaction at its handiwork as it returned to its restful slumber. Due to their mechanical legs, even in death, Primus and Secundus remained upright, like two macabre statues of flesh and steel on display in the Xenos tomb of deception and lies. Sir Lambert and the Red Knight by Alessio Cavatore Lambert de Lilaz was riding along a narrow path in the very heart of the forest of Chalon. Under the dense foliage, the light of the day was reduced to a grey haze, but following the tracks left by the one he was searching for was not difficult. It seemed that no attempt at all had been made to conceal them. Alas, what an arrogant villain this must be who did not fear the rightful vengeance of the Knights of Bretonia. Only that morning, during his long quest for the Grail, Lambert had passed through a woodcutter's village at the edge of the forest. The poor men living there had pleaded with him to save them from the Red Knight of Chalon. They told him in despair of how this terrible warrior had ridden into their village over the last four nights to abduct their sons and daughters. He was mounted on a huge black warhorse and clad in a blood-red suit of armour. The device on his shield was that of a coiled black dragon on a red field. Lambert recognised him as one of the legendary cursed knights of the Grey Mountains. Certainly, he thought, it was a trial set by the lady on his quest for the Grail, and so he had entered the dark forest. In the dim light of the sunset, the path led him to a clearing, and there he was. Standing in the middle of the small glade, his opponent seemed to be waiting for him. His helm was on the ground, so Lambert could see the long mane of thin black hair that contrasted so intensely with his pale complexion, as well as with his crimson plate armour. I am Lambert de Lilas, Knight of Bretonia. Mount your steed and prepare to fight. May the lady give me the strength to strike you down and put an end to your evil deeds, sounded the proud challenge of the questing knight. After a few seconds of tense silence, the Red Knight spoke in a calm and confident voice. You should not be so concerned about the fate of commoners, young Lambert. They are not worth what you are risking. This fight is meaningless. You have no hope of defeating me, and I have no interest in such an uneven confrontation. Furthermore, I am already sated with the blood of those peasants, and I do not need to take your life. Ride away, boy. A Nosferatu. At first, Lambert was astonished, but then a deep rage filled him. He lowered his lance and spurred his warhorse, charging the vampire with a shout of, For the lady and the king! The red knight did not move, and Lambert's lance found its mark. The shaft shattered as the knight galloped by his opponent. The Bretonian was immediately filled by a sense of triumph. Every opponent he had hit like that had been skewered and slain by the irresistible force of his lance. Nothing could withstand such a terrible impact. Lambert halted his warhorse and turned it around. The vampire was still standing. The lance had penetrated his chest, just under the collarbone, and the tip was now protruding from below his shoulder blade. The creature turned slowly towards Lambert, pulled the thick wooden shaft out of his body, and dropped it with an unnatural nonchalance. I told you that you cannot win this combat, boy. I will not repeat myself again. Now leave. Perhaps you are right, creature of the night. Perhaps I cannot defeat you but I am a knight and I will never break my code of honour. Death is preferable to cowardice. Defend yourself. Drawing his sword, Lambert attacked again. When he reached the enemy, he swung his sword in a wide, deadly arc. This time the vampire moved. With blinding speed, his right hand raised and grasped Lambert's wrist, while the left easily stopped the charging warhorse. For a second, the eaves of the two warriors met. Looking into those two pools of ancient darkness, Lambert understood that there were powers in the world against which he was less than nothing. 
Then the vampire unhorsed him and flung him like a puppet into the trees. Lambert crashed against a trunk and darkness engulfed him. When he opened his eyes, the red knight was in front of him, a sad smile on his lips. Lambert realized he had been thrown over the saddle of his own horse. He tried to move, but his body was overwhelmed by pain and his muscles didn't respond to his will. I am sparing your life, Lambert. You fought with courage. I'm leaving this forest. You have saved your precious peasants, so your pride is intact. Now let your magnificent steed take you to the village. There you will rest and heal so that you can continue your quest. If you complete it, you will become a more interesting opponent, and maybe we will have a fairer duel if we meet again. My name is Caleb, of the Order of the Blood Dragon, and if you learnt something from tonight's experience, you will not come after me before you are ready. Fare thee well, Knight of Britonia. After the vampire disappeared into the darkness, Lambert realised that he had indeed learnt something. He had been taught a hard but necessary lesson. Only now did he understand that he was lacking one of the most important knightly virtues. To reach perfection and see the grail a knight needed, humility. He praised the lady for this revelation and then slipped once more into unconsciousness.